items that the admin and finance um, uh, resolution 2023-71 will be brought to full board plus 20, uh, 23-79 will also be brought before the full board in that I pulled the uh, resolution that Commissioner Menz and Vice President Smith um, submitted. Refer I will be referring that to admin and finance for our next meeting to address the EAB impact. So, can I have a motion for the approval of the agenda with those? So moved. Second. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? I'd like to move to amend the agenda. Can I move to amend the agenda? We'll, we'll do that. Okay. We'll make it After it's approved. Okay. Um, all those in favor, please. Uh, point of order. You want to do it now? I believe that now that now is when we're considering the agenda, and now would be the appropriate time for a motion to be made to amend it. Is that appropriate? Sorry. Okay. Um, all right, Commissioner. Mintz. I move to amend the agenda Second. to include uh, resolution 2023-89 on this agenda. Second. Any discussion on that item? And maybe you would like to read your resolution yep. that you want to forward. So I am reading this resolution. So this is the resolution that was pulled uh, by uh, President Smith, and I think that we should discuss it uh, today President at the Ford. full board, or if not, at the admin and finance. Resolution directing staff to temporarily delay the levying of property assessments for the costs associated with removing trees invested with EAB on private property until October 4th, 2023, to allow time for a funding solution to be established for residents in MPRB District 2 of Minneapolis through means of a third party, and to continue to identify EAB trees on private property as a measure of public health and empowering staff to work with local organizations, including the City of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, State of Minnesota, and other organizations who help provide assistance for home ownership fees and to establish an emergency action committee to address this issue during this period in this designated area of Minneapolis and directing staff to report back to the board on August 2nd, 2023 and October 4th, 2023. Commissioner Musich. I have a point of parliamentary inquiry. Since this item was not part of the agenda at the time that the meeting started, does it require a suspension of the rules <laughs> to consider it uh, as an amendment to the agenda or do we just need a um, majority, super majority vote in order to add it? because it had been previously submitted. Um, Madam President. Please. Um, Commissioner Musich, it's, it's an interesting question. Ordinarily, I would say I would take a motion to suspend the rules to add it, but it, it was noticed prior to uh, the agenda, so my ruling would be that it would take a majority of the commissioners present to add it. It would take four votes to add it. Or, excuse me, yes, four. There's seven commissioners. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Menz. Um, sorry. Um, I'd like to speak to this because I think it is timely. So I think that the, we are currently, there is, there is a surplus, there is, and I, and I understand that this is directing things towards uh, Commissioner Thompson's district. We have all received a lot of public input on this, and I don't want to be reactive, but I think that it is it is time for us to discuss and sort of plan for this, and this actually is not, it's only directing staff to sort of figure this out with other state agencies. So I don't, I don't see the, the difficulty in this, but I could be wrong. Commissioner Musich. Um, I'm interested in understanding whether or not the District 2 Commissioner was consulted or involved in the crafting of this resolution. And perhaps that's, that's something the District 2 Commissioner would like to respond to or the resolution author. I don't, I don't know who. I was not a part of this resolution crafting, nor was I aware that my district was specifically named in the resolution. Thank you for that additional context and information. Um, I understand the desire to respond to residents' needs for relief. Uh, I did have conversations today with both county and city staff that informed me that they are both, both agencies are working 
at a state level to ensure that a relief program is crafted, not only for residents of District 2, but for all homeowners that are uh, adversely impacted by this pest that is decimating our ash trees in the state of Minnesota. Um, understanding that and, and also wanting to be respectful of district commissioners uh, and their need to be able to have a, an ability to craft resolutions that are specifically impacting the district that they represent. Um, I will not be supporting this this evening. Commissioner Schaefer. I just wanted to ask Commissioner Thompson how, what would be your preference? Would you like to move this to admin finance tonight? Would you like to pull it and work with the resolution crafters? Um, what would be your preference here? Thank you for that question. I would request that we pull it um, due to the, the difficulties of making sure this is worded in a way that respects our um, <clears throat> different agencies and, and, and supporting governing people at the state or the county or whatever level that we need while also making sure that it is something that the entire board can get behind um, given that I was not part of this process I, I, would not, I would prefer to not have that discussion from this dais but rather perhaps crafting something later Thank you for asking. Vice President Smith. Thank you. I think that the conversation without uh, Commissioner Thompson was, was just simply an oversight. But this is about the people, not about an individual. And so I think that in the spirit of where we're going um, and in the hundreds of people that I've talked to as an at-large commissioner in District 2 specifically. I'm, I'm going to support it, obviously, as a co-author. And I, I think it's just necessary that we sort of just make ourselves a little smaller and put the people first. Commissioner Alper, I think you're next. Thanks. I just, uh, I'm just pulling it up on my phone here, and I... Um, did not realize that there was the District 2 uh, specifically, and I, um, I mean, I would hope that we would address other, other places too as part of this. I mean, think about the South Side Green Zone um, specifically. So just, I, I plan to vote in favor of amending the agenda, but um, I, I would hope that we could maybe strike that specific district reference. Commissioner, excuse me, <coughs> Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, President <coughs> Forney. Um, I, I respect the idea of wanting to be timely. I don't think it's that difficult to wait two weeks. Um, I also think that it's more than an oversight given that communication happens between colleagues all the time. And I will state plainly that I was alarmed to see my district specifically named when I was apprised of very little. There was one short conversation asking if I would support a measure about the Emerald Ash Borer, which I said I did in theory, but we needed to, the devil was in the details. In no way was I alerted to the fact that this resolution specifically talks about my constituency, and I was never once looped in. And I do take umbrage with that. It was more than an oversight. I support my constituents. I support anybody who faces this hardship. And I do have worked very hard with my colleagues to try to find administrative ways that we can help this exacerbated situation. I agree with Commissioner Elper. It is much larger than the north side. This is, these are the very things that I am hoping that we can solve by delaying this. That's it. Thank you. Commissioner Manns for a second time. Um, Commissioner Thompson, I, I do hear your frustration. And I, I apologize for that 
for the way that this is being is landing. Um, as District One Commissioner, I feel a strong urge and need to stretch our boundaries around how we support different parts of our communities. And the siloing that we do is very challenging because I was elected by District 1, but I serve the entire city and the park board. And this was intended to show allyship with the north side. My inability to communicate with uh, Commissioner Thompson effectively over the past week is also partly a result of life, getting in the way of being an elected official and a full-time employee and a coach and all those things. But I do sincerely apologize to Commissioner Thompson for any um, specific Thank you. Um, injury. So I just, oh, the Commissioner. Um, but I do think it's important for us to, to move this forward now and to specifically name District 2 much, because Lewis. we need to direct money where it goes instead of, instead of leveling off. Order. I just, I appreciate the timely discussion. I think we could also do a lot of this work behind the scenes and bring it forward in committee and full board in the same night if we so choose and still keep the same time frame that you're talking about and that would allow the three of you or whoever else wants to join in the broader discussion um, to maybe work out the, work out the details behind the scenes and not bring it right now tonight. That would be my preference. Um, and I think that would show um, sensitivity to Commissioner Thompson as well as sensitivity to your perspective on the timeliness because we could bring it forward the same night. Thank you. So I'll just weigh in. Um, I, I will not be supporting this um, being uh, moved at the full board. Um, if you wish to bring it up in committee, that's fine. But as I indicated, I'd like it to be brought up at the next meeting. Um, unfortunately, we do have procedures, gang, and um, staff um, has a routine of how things um, happen. Um, at no point in time was I consulted about um, this particular resolution. I am the president. I am the one who makes a final say on the agenda. So um, being that um, myself, the president, and the district commissioner were not consulted, I do truly feel that it should not be um, uh, voted on or shared, shall we say. We're voting on whether it should be on the agenda, but I will not be voting in favor. So all those in favor, I think we should take a roll call. Um, with the secretary please <coughs> call the roll on that, sorry. Can I have a point of clarification? Are we voting now? We've already amending suspended, the agenda, we're amending the agenda. Okay, I wanna be clear of what I'm. Commissioner Thompson. No. Commissioner Schaefer. No. Commissioner Olson. Absent. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Menz. Aye. Commissioner Alper. Aye. Commissioner Abene. Absent. Vice President Smith. Aye. President Forney. No. You have three um, ayes, four nays, two absent. So that fails. Um, so on to, once again, approving the full agenda. We would, all those in favor of the agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. That motion carries. On to the approval of the minutes from April 12th, 2023. I'll move the minutes from April 12th, 2023. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That action carries. Okay. Um, we do not have reports of officers. Do we have any reports of appointees to outside boards, commissions, and committees? Yes, uh, Commissioner um, Elk. Yeah, thanks. I just would like to give a report from the Planning Commission uh, meeting, which was Monday. And I uh, just wanted to let you all know that we did pass the land use rezoning study and that um, I'm happy to report that the, um, <coughs> the path forward that planning staff, Park uh, MPRB planning staff desired was the path that the city took. So I um, feel that we were well represented in that aspect and I just wanted to share that thanks thank you I'll give her um, two seconds maybe three seconds um, but Commissioner Benny we are in reports of appointees um, to the outside boards commissions and committees if you would like to report <laughs> I apologize but we're glad that you're here 
Thank you, and th thank you for that, um, and saying, giving me a moment here to open my portfolio. So I was just at the Board of Estimate and Taxation meeting, which is why I'm late, and um, we received the quarterly report, the financial status report from the city. I'm a little out of breath, I'm sorry. And um, also we uh, had a presentation from the city assessor, which the Park Board will have on May 10th, I believe. So that was great. Um, the other uh, committee I attended this week, actually, on Monday was the audit committee and um, the uh, you know the the department's growing because of the new structure and um, they've now they're taking on now um, a few different things for their new 2023 risk-based integrated audit plan so again it's a risk-based audit and um, one of the things that I thought was particularly noteworthy that what I wanted to mention is one item will be an audit that will include the park board uh, about uh, public feedback and it's called the public feedback engagement process and the objective is to review the public engagement process to ensure controls that mitigate emergent risks are functioning as expected and um, they talked about you know sort of setting it up saying that engagement with the pu public is the thing that builds trust with the community and the, the city the park board um, it also public engagement improves decision making in the organizations um, it, they talked about some risks and um, including um, you know operational financial you know strategic and reputation risks missed opportunities um, but they also said that they did some preliminary discussion with the staff and that staff are receiving an overwhelming number of communications when items draw widespread attention so in one case they said that some project received 20,000 comments um, and this has the risk of vo uh, uh, drowning out the voices of the residents. So I'm, I'm particularly excited about this one because we have a public en engagement process here at the Park Board. And as a person that relies on the findings of those, um, um, you know, processes, it's really important to me to know who I'm hearing from. So that's my report. Awesome. Thank you for your good work. Not seeing any others. Okay, um, we will then go to the consent um, agenda. Um, is there any items that need to be pulled for discussion, or shall we move that forward as is? I will move the consent agenda as a slate. Second. Thank you. <coughs> All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That action carries. On to then uh, reports of standing committee, and we have admin and finance committee. Uh, on behalf of admin finance, I'd like to move resolution 2023-45, resolution also authorizing the use of Minnesota state contract number 218090 with St. Croix Recreation Fund Playgrounds Incorporated in the amount of $315,039.54 to furnish and construct the playground improvements at Hall Park located in the North Service area of Minneapolis and further recommending that the Board of Commissioners amend the 2023 Capital Improvement Program to allocate 130138 from the Near North Neighborhood portion of the Dibble Hornstein Parkland Dedication Fund to complete the proposed project. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on this item? Not seeing any lights. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? That, um, action carries. Okay, on to the next resolution. Uh, also, on behalf of Admin Finance, I will move resolution 2023-64, resolution approving a five-year concession agreement with the Minneapolis Water Taxi LLC to expire December 31st, 2027. <coughs> Excuse me. Second. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Music. Thank you, President Forney. Uh, I have a question for... The staff contact for this oh thank you mr stencil you are here um can you tell us please who the members of water minneapolis water taxi llc are uh, president forney commissioner Musich. um the owners of the llc are greg holseth and corey parkos okay thank you uh i would like to make a motion to table this resolution I would second that. Any discussion? Commissioner Musage, no? Any Is there discussion? a reason why we want to table it? Commissioner Musage? Uh, at this time, one member of the LLC has an illegally moored houseboat on Park Board property. And until such a time as they're compliant with Park Board rules and regulations, I do not believe we should be entering into an agreement with that organization. 
so that is why I'm asking that we table it. Any other discussion? Commissioner Alper? Yeah, thanks. I'd just like to hear from, from staff on this. I mean, obviously, this, was, this is on our agenda. This came out of committee. This was passed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, does staff feel like there's any reason to deny this resolution tonight? President Forney, uh, Commissioner Alper, um, I just bring it forward to you guys, and you're the ones that decide on how this is voted on. So, I uh, we have a we have a known uh, um, encroachment, and uh, we've been working with that. And uh, this isn't a separate issue that I'm bringing forward. So, I leave it to you guys to um, to decide on how you want to proceed. Commissioner Mintz. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, wait. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Alp. Aban, excuse me. Uh, thank you, President Forney. Well, um, you know, I'm, I wanted to kind of ask a question. I think it's related to the idea of tabling it. Um, but, um, but one of the notes that I had is this is, you know, I think, a, um, you know, an, a great opportunity, I think, both for the vendor and for the, um, you know, people that use that location and people that will enjoy the service. <clears throat> but, um, you know, maybe you could tell me, um, Mr. Senzel, what the, um, how do you enforce what's actually occurring in terms of compliance with the permit? Because there's things like even dock storage over the winter, I believe, you know, I looked at this last time, <laughs> and I can see how that sometimes the scope could creep on what gets stored over the winter. So what in what, in what ways are you actually going to be enforcing the conditions of the agreement? Um, President Forney, Commissioner Rebeni, um there is no agreement on the particular encroachment. Um, What's forward is the uh, is is the water taxi operation, um, and which is the agreement that we're trying to come to that does not include that encroached vessel, and so um, that's the kind of the question there, I guess. And and we're working through uh, legal on. There's a couple encroachments that we're working through. And I don't mean just the encroachments, if, you, if that's okay, President Forney, but um, the, I mean the agreement itself, the terms of the agreement. So there are things in there about the houseboat, um, use of electricity, which I'm assuming they have to have their own electrical service and meter yep. and things like that. But how do you, what, in what ways, what measures does staff take to make sure that the agreement is being adhered to? Uh, President Forney, Commissioner Benny, um, so there's conditions within the agreement that, that spell out what they can and can't do and what the consequences are if they don't and that's in pretty standard in all of our agreements so if you don't pay your bill you bring something else in how you use the property is very standard with all of our all of our agreements and then there's a consequence you know there's there's uh, notice served and then you potentially could uh, lose the contract so uh, again that's pretty standard boilerplate in all of our uh, contract languages and if I, I, just to clarify, but do you go out weekly and check? Oh. Do you go out periodically, once at the beginning, once at the end of the season? Yeah, uh, President Forney, uh, Commissioner Benny. Um, most of our concessions, I feel like I'm better about every day, um, particularly in the spring as we're getting open, but mostly monthly. Uh, we do monthly check-ins. Public will report a lot of things too on how our facilities are being used. So like our concessions, for example. Um, we might get a report from our, our maintenance staff or a park police or anything like that. So between myself and staff, if there's, a, if there's an issue, something happening that's not within the contract, that's reported. Otherwise, we find it and then we start, um, we start rectifying those situations right away. Yep. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, President Forney. I just have a question for you, uh, Director Stenzel. Was this, this, was this encroachment something that we were aware of as we were also trying to put forward this agreement? Was there some sort of caveat time frame? Um, or was this something that came about after we started uh, crafting this resolution? Uh, President Forney, Commissioner Thompson, um, we were aware the we were, we, we are and were, as we were crafted this agreement, aware of the encroachment. We were also told lots of things on how the, the, the encroachment was going to be rectified to keep the process moving. We agree with the water taxi program. We think it's a great thing, um, but there is that little sticking point about the ownership of it. Um, I've been working with Council Rice for probably the last three years 
on these encroachments. It's not just a singular watercraft. There's two um, that we are currently trying to um, mitigate that's those situations. Um, so like I said, we were told that certain things were going to happen, but haven't. So. Sorry, I almost have too many questions that my brain got bottlenecked there. Um, so, so uh, from my understanding, this this was this encroachment was meant to intended to be dealt with before this moment where we would potentially be. So, since one party has not followed their end of the bargain, I completely agree with my colleague, uh, Commissioner Musich, to table this. Um, thank you, Commissioner Mans. Um, this is in my district, and I am aware of this issue. Uh, I have been on the water taxi. I have also worked with uh, Director Stenzel on this issue, and I and I commend you for finding a way forward. So, this is an opportunity for us to increase recreation on the river. And although there are there is a houseboat that is remaining in a different location, and I don't want to confuse the houseboat that's named in the agreement with the houseboat that is um, illegally or out of compliance. Uh, with what our rules are right now. That the houseboat that's in the agreement is something that's like more like an office space for the, the new water taxi that's going to be at Boom Island, if I'm correct. I can speak to that. Um, President Forney, Commissioner Mintz, correct. That, that vessel was negotiated out. It's not even purchased. It's not even owned. It's not, it doesn't exist. It just allows for the capability of should we need space without building something like a kiosk or something up above so for an office space whatnot it's not for leisure it's not for tours it's not for any of that type of thing it's strictly for office use hasn't been procured yet nothing it's just part of the negotiations we said if we ever get to this point it would be allowed so we don't come back to the board and say you know this or that but this does not include what's currently there this is a completely separate vessel so when have those in that houseboat we use the word houseboat, call it an office boat, would not have the same capabilities, bedrooms, kitchen, any of that would be strictly an office type vessel that would, that, that's allowed in the current contract. Um, I would also like to alert my colleagues to the fact that the reason why we have the possibility of a Minneapolis water taxi is because of the person who is in the violation and we can use that stick we can we can try to but i think that we run the risk of of eliminating that process or that water taxi possibility and i and i think that that is not appropriate that the that we are that mr parkos is in violation with his houseboat it has been there for a while there is some difficulty around what the city allowed there, there are there are some complications there's some complex environments and council rice has been through this and they are in violation i don't think that that should prevent us from moving forward because i think that what is going to happen with the water taxi and the other owner is going to have benefit to the constituents and the encroachment is not necessarily providing a negative impact on the citizens in on, in the district. That it is a it's a violation. We need to deal with it. But I don't think it should encroach or impede us from providing more recreation on the river with work that has been done by our staff to, to work through that. So that's just my I would I would vote not to table, and I'd vote for you. I would ask you to support this um, new venture on the river because I think it's going to be great for Northeast and for people who want to go on the river. Fortunately, we have to cease this conversation and move to our open time. Um, so thank you all um, who want to share your thoughts and ideas with us during open time. Before we start, I want to provide an abbreviated version of open time board rules. All individuals wishing, wishing to speak may call in before noon the day of the meeting to be placed on the agenda or can sign up at the board meeting prior to, open, uh, prior to the start of open time. And I will be calling on the people that are on the list only.
Um, open time for public input shall not exceed a total of 15 minutes with the time limit to be allocated by myself, the president. Please watch the timer up here to be considerate of others here to speak and stay within your allotted time. Um, during open time, public testimony will be given without debate and only clarifying questions from the board will be allowed. Two types of items not appropriate for open time in order to protect the privacy of all of those are pending litigation, personnel issues. So please refrain from com commenting on these specific personnel issues. Um, we will not tolerate discriminatory and or harassing words directed at anyone. So please ensure that all co comments you make tonight comply with the policy. This board made the decision many years ago to operate under Robert's rules of order. Under Robert's rules of order, the ceding of time to another person is not allowed. So only those signed up to speak may only speak for their own allotted amount of time. We also request that each speaker provide his or her name um, and address. And we have five speakers, so I'm going to give each one three minutes piece. The first person is Jessica Kolchik. I'm not sure if I pronounced you correct. And the next person is going to be um, uh, Sidar uh, Dashpan. If you want to queue up, I appreciate it. Jessica. Hi. Thank you. Um, oh, the, in the microphone. Second Good. One. Thank you. My name is Jessica Kotchik. I'm a high school teacher at uh, Washburn High School, and I live in the Whittier neighborhood near 24th and Pillsbury. Um, this is my third season um, as a member of the Sioux Line Community Garden, and I'm here today because I want to ask you to protect the garden. Um, I did send an email a while back, and I appreciate, I know some of you responded, so thank you for that. Um, so in our garden plot, um, it's plot number 304, if you want to check it out. Um, we grow the ingredients uh, we need for salsa verde, so tomatillos, onion, garlic, cilantro, and jalapenos. Um, and then we can a bunch of it at the end of the season and have it all winter. Um, it's so much better than anything you can get at the grocery store. Um, but more important than that to me is the garden community. Um, I went back there to plant spring seeds and was just filled with joy being there. Um, it's incredible to do something you love alongside your neighbors. I've met so many people. I, we have volunteer evenings and weekends. I get to use my Spanish. We've done tours with the Whittier Elementary kids. It's really an incredible place. Uh, it's my favorite place in Minneapolis. Um, and Hennepin County's plan to pave over a large part of it and turn it into a transit connection to the Greenway is incompatible with a community garden space. Um, I'm also really concerned about the environmental impact. I know you know that it's built on top of a brownfield site and that there's toxic toxins under the soil and that garden helps to protect that. Um, I'm worried that the plan could end up making it so that we can't garden there at all and that those toxins are released into the community. Um, Sioux Line is like one fourth of one city block in one of the densest neighborhoods in the city. And I'm just asking you to protect that. It doesn't need to be paved over. It doesn't need to be part of a transit connection. I'm a bike rider, love the Greenway, um, but that's just not the right site. Given what we know about climate change and the need for more green space and more permeable space, I think we need to have more spaces like this, not less. Um, when I think about this, I feel sick to my stomach because that's how important it is to me to have, it's a huge um, part of my life mm -hmm. and part of how I get to be in community in Minneapolis. Um, so please protect it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Kadar, and then after that is Dale Hum. Hi, good evening. My name's Kadar Deshpande and I live in Whittier and my partner Jess and I share a garden plot at the Sioux Line Community Gardens. I just want to start with a couple questions. When was the last time you had your hands in the soil and grew something from seed? When was the last time you shared vegetables and recipes with neighbors you otherwise would have never known? For me, that answer was, was never. I never had that opportunity until I found the Sioux Line Community Gardens two years ago. I live in Whittier, which is the densest and most diverse neighborhood 
in the city. But I'm also a renter and I don't have space of my own to grow my own plants, grow my own uh, vegetables. I also don't really have that much space to take refuge in a natural, calm environment. I think Minneapolis is a green city for sure with no shortage of space to bike, walk, roll, ski, swim, hike. But the number of places to get your hands in the ground and, and take <coughs> advantage of the, the world around you and meet people is actually few and far between. When I looked at the Parks Board website, I noticed that there's only nine listed community gardens and then four that are operated by groups like the Sioux Line community. And of those nine, the bulk of them are built up and have just a few planter boxes scattered around. That's not the situation at Sioux Line where we have nearly 100 plots and 150 gardeners and a constant waiting list for people wanting to be able to plant and grow and, and, and learn about the world around them. You know, families go to the Sioux Line for joy. I see kids running and, and playing with, with their neighbors. Um, it's a really special place where people from all different backgrounds speaking multiple languages come together to steward something that's, that's just a, a beautiful, simple area. And yet Hennepin County has plans to try to pave it over, despite the fact that it has no rights to the land, as far as I am able to understand. So I'm here to ask you to defend the Sioux Line Community Garden. Defend and preserve this special place that's a rare asset in the city and a rare asset in the Minneapolis park system. We need to preserve our green spaces and not get rid of them. Thank you. Thank you, Dale, and then uh, Kareem is after that. Kareem um, Murphy, I believe. Hello, my name's Dale Hill. I'm the executive director of New Directions Youth Ministry in North Minneapolis. And uh, for 37 years, we've been uh, uh, producing park board hockey uh, in North Minneapolis. And for most of that time, we've been the only uh, uh, vendor of that. Uh, activity. We uh, work with Northeast Minneapolis in that uh, much of the sport of hockey is governed by a larger board called USA Hockey, which leads up into high school play, and so uh, we're involved with that as well. Um, I'm here tonight uh, to speak to the uh, one of your agenda items, the North Commons Park Phase 1 improvements. And uh, we've been involved with that in developing the master plan there since uh, 2017. And actually our efforts to, uh, to build a refrigerated rink go back uh, even back to 2012 or 2013 uh, when we were working with the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission to, uh, to create uh, matching funds uh, for uh, one of the Hennepin Youth Sports Grants to build that rink. Well, they've gone up a lot in price since those days. But um, we were, we were kind of disappointed in January to find out that the refrigerated rink and a lot of other improvements had gone on to phase two rather than phase one, which means that they would probably be continued maybe in time for my grandchildren to play there. Uh, so it kind of went off our radar screen. But then I went to the meeting uh, last night w at North Commons Park and found out that uh, refrigerated ice rink uh, was on page 18. And uh, the other good thing that came through that uh, the fact that, well, it's on page 18 as a maybe in, in the third category, which is kind of like pie in the sky. Uh, but the first two categories say no. But the other good thing about the, the way that the three options that you are presented with came out is that the position of the ice rink, which is exactly where the refrigerated ice rink was planned in the master plan, is the same in all three, and it's exactly where it is now. So it fits really well 
with some any future planning for uh, hockey and figure skating and recreational skating at North Commons Park. Uh, and by the way, uh, somebody at the meeting said that nobody plays hockey in North Minneapolis. Uh, you got to go there. I mean, I, that person had never been outside in the winter, I guess, because every night of the week over at North Commons Park, you'll see teams playing hockey over there and uh, Saturdays as well. Uh, so what I what we we have been working on raising the money for the, the rink ourselves because we realized it was out of the master plans. Deal? Can you drop? Yeah, I'm going to finish it. Thank and you. so, uh, what we would ask the park board to do, if you would, when you consider on page 18, uh, please put a maybe in on option A and option B. Thank you. So that if we raise the funding, it could be then built on the site as according to the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Corrine, and then Don Tupanin. Thank you. <laughs> Madam President, Commissioners, my name is Corrine Murphy. I live next to the North Commons Park in the Willard Hay neighborhood here in Minneapolis. I use the park multiple times a day, every day of the year, outside of my vacation outside of Minnesota. This park is not just important to me, but it's important to the youth and seniors who live around me. I'm speaking on their behalf today. Uh, despite extensive outreach, there's been just too many people who are not part of your survey data whose lives will be made better by your upping your game on how you redevelop this park. I'm here to call on this board to make the biggest, boldest, broadest investment in the redevelopment of Minneapolis parks and park and park board history. You have the power to do that, and this is the moment. You need to go big or you need to go home. You need to stretch yourselves, and, and the stretching needs to be difficult. This system should feel some pain because of your, dedicating, your dedication to making the North Commons Park and Recreation Center the best park in the nation. I will be blunt. Option A, the cheapest option, is just not acceptable. Option A is the easy choice. It's the choice that reaffirms the community's well-founded belief that government disinvests in communities of black and brown people. This park is on the top 10 list of your park equity assessment. The project's uh, maps, uh, the comprehensive plan and strategic direction A that addresses health disparities and environmental, in environmental justice. If you look at any of the state and county heat maps for asthma and other environmental chronic diseases, you'll see that this park is in the center of the worst suffering. The project also maps with your strategic directions B, C, D, and E. I would say that probably more fully than any other map in the redevelopment queue. The history of the park system is deeply intertwined with the history of racial covenants, redlining, and all of the soft and hard tools government and society have used to create the conditions I find now in my community. This project represents the park board's best opportunity to right this historic wrong. Go big. You need to redirect staff to remove option A from consideration and to focus on option C or getting us as close as possible to that option. I'll say in closing that at our community meeting last night, which I attended, there was a lot of tension. I was disturbed by a question from my, my, my person over here. Where I would call him my friend. We haven't really formally met yet. But um, there was a conversation just about uh, the ice rink. Um, honestly, what it sounded like to me as this black man sits here to you today was the worst kind of gentrification I've seen brought in this community, which is happening very rapidly. But then it occurred to me. We're fighting each other over crumbs because staff is fearful that the report that there's only enough money to fund the low cost option. This community does not deserve crumbs. Don't go small, be big, and represent the boldest, best park that we can possibly have. We deserve better than crumbs. We deserve cakes and streets paved with gold. Thank you. Thank you. I will close now the um, open time and go back to I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, well, Donna, appreciate, appreciate you understanding. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, my name is, I'm, I'm Dan Turpening. Oh, Dan, sorry. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm here because of the street, street, the street, the bus care permit that, that has been enacted. And I have been a, a musician for 
a long time and a street musician for 25 years in the cities and know a lot of other street musicians. And um, a lot of street musicians, um, I made a little list here. So uh, I just want to start because, you know, a lot of street musicians, the way that you've worked out your permit thing online, um, it requires an address. And a lot of musicians don't even have an address. Like I, I, I had very good friends, Chester and Marsha, who, who used to live under a bridge, who are now, have now passed away. And they were street musicians for, for decades and um, really added a lot to the city. And this permit with the $40 and them being forced to apply, that would have made it impossible for them. And I, I, I know that they're not alone in that. Um, so I think that this permit system, what it, what it, what is, what it seems to me what it's going to do is, is, is be uninclusive of people instead of inclusive. Um, and you know, buskers by nature, um, it's a fiercely independent bunch, and and they're they're not going to. The ones that I've talked to are pretty upset about it, and um, they're not going to. Um, they're not going to want to jump through the hoops to to to, to do this. And um, um, what else did I want to say? Sorry, I'm not used to speaking in public. <laughs> um, um, and I'm, I'm also curious, you know, you, th so they have to apply, and I'm, I'm wondering, who, who gets to decide who, who, who gets the permit? I mean, how does that work? Um, and also, and also I, I'm just curious as to why this is even an issue. Um, you know, everyone that I've known has never had a problem with, with people. They're all, they're all, they're all pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, um, they're nice to people. I mean, I'm not, I'm not choosing my words here, but they're, they, they're courteous to, to the public. And they're out there because, really, really because they love to be there. I mean, you know, none of us are making a lot of money doing this. And so, honestly, the, the, the $40, even though that doesn't sound like a lot of money, it's very often when I'm working for $5 an hour, you know, when I'm out there. And so $40 really actually is a, is a fair amount of money. And again, the hoops. And, um, and to me, this just, this seems like a solution looking for a problem to me. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Um, I would like to refer you, Dan, up to Shane Stencil, but he's going to be needing to talk. He's right behind you in the tie. Anyway, he's going to be needing to talk to us a, a little bit longer and everything. Um, and then also, if uh, those about uh, North Commons, if you'd like to talk with Michael uh, Schroeder, Assistant uh, Superintendent Planning, um, and I can't remember, oh, Sue Line, uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder is also a good person to speak to. And he's, stand, he's sitting right over there, waving his hand. Anyway, so um, back then, now I'm going to close the open time. I apologize, everybody, for that air. Um, was there somebody else who wanted to speak to this? No? Okay. Okay. So I, I'm just going to comment and everything. Uh, I love the water taxi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's just, it, well, uh, I'm, a, um, <clears throat> I'm a river person <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, I am going to also vote to uh, table this. Um, first of all, I just, <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but nobody's out on that river right now. Um, it's a in quite a hazardous uh, place. Um, and it's probably going to be a couple weeks before it's going to be uh, navigable. So um, I believe that tabling it um, is, is fine uh, as far as it won't uh, curtail uh, any business for you. Um, but we do have this lingering issue that I just want to make sure is totally resolved um, before we um, secure this. And so um, I really, really appreciate you guys, what you've done, you know, Greg, thank you for introducing it, Corey, I adore you, uh, and Dan for, you know, being involved. Uh, but I, I really would like to have this tabled. So um, all those are, who are in favor of tabling, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. No. That action carries. Abstain. So where are we at now? Sorry. Abstained, okay. Okay, so the resolution has been tabled. Okay, so now we are on to unfinished business. Okay, uh, if somebody would like to move um, the next resolution. I'll move resolution 2023-74. It's a resolution granting a temporary construction easement to the University of Minnesota for purposes of, construct of a construction project to replace Fraser Hall 
106 Pleasant Street Southeast, Minneapolis, which abuts East River Parkway, located within Central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park. Can I get a second? Second. <laughs> Any discussion, uh, Commissioner Abene? Thank you, President Forney. Um, I would like to, I'm just going to recuse myself from this vote and the discussion. Um, the main, uh, you know, the main issue at hand is that I, I work at the University of Minnesota. In fact, I work with the, the group that's involved in the development of this, redevelopment of this building. Um, and just for people that might be paying attention on the consent agenda, there was something related to the university doing bee research, and I didn't recuse myself from that. So I think it's, it's really a different, um, it's a different, um, relationship that I, ha I don't have a relationship with the, the research and um, uh, at, um, academic side of the institution. But I do want to just make one comment, and that would be that I think uh, I'd just like to share that I think that there's been an outstanding amount of collaboration between the two organizations, not particular to this. I actually am not privy to uh, what's been said, how this has been going behind the scenes, but just in general, the two organizations have been working together really well for the last dozen or so years, and um, it, there's a lot of mutual benefit in that relationship so with that I'll I'll step away any other discussion seeing any other lights all those in favor yeah. do we need to roll call on this okay yeah Will the secretary please call the roll Commissioner Thompson aye Commissioner Schaefer aye Commissioner Olson absent Commissioner Musich aye Commissioner Menz aye Commissioner Alper aye Commissioner Abeni recused herself. Vice President Smith. Aye. President <laughs> Forney. Aye. You have seven ayes, one absent, and one recusal. Thank you. That action carries. And I've just been alerted that maybe I misspoke on the uh, last resolution on 2023-64 uh, with the secretary. Um, for all of us, um, please call the roll on that just to make sure we've got that correct. And that's regarding the uh, tabling of the um, concession agreement with Water Taxi. Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Commissioner Schaefer. Abstain. Commissioner Olson. Absent. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Menz. No. Commissioner Alper. Abstain. Commissioner Abene. Aye. Vice President Smith. No. President Forney. Aye. You have four ayes, two nays, two abstain, and one absent. So I would read that that carries. Okay. Madam President, could you give me a minute? Would the Secretary repeat the vote? You have four ayes two nays, two abstain, and one absent. Uh, Madam President, if you could give me a minute under Robert's rules, I believe an abstention on a question like this would act as a no vote. So if the vote is no, I'll have to check that. If that's the case, then a, an abstention is a no vote, in which case the motion would be four to four, and it means it would not pass. Let me uh, check that if I could. Sorry. Not for you. Okay, we'll give you a, a couple moments. Should we go to at least the next um, resolution, if that's okay with people? Um, I mean, we have a 6.30 um, uh, Public hearing. Anyway, so the next uh, resolution. Resolution 2023 83. I'll read resolution 2023 83. Resolution amending resolution 2021 312, reaffirming the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's participation in the City of Minneapolis Hardship Deferral Program for Special Assessments and to provide additional support for property owners experiencing hardship to further expand the options and allow a resident experiencing hardship the ability to pay the assessment over a 20-year term. Second. Okay, any discussion on this item? Would we like to have a presentation? I 
<laughs> okay, we'll have a presentation. Uh, Director Weissman, thank you, thank you. I'm going to introduce Assistant Superintendent Jeremy Barrick, who will present the first few slides, and then I'll walk you through the resolution. Thanks, Julie, uh, Madam President, Commissioners. Yeah, quick update on the background with the Emerald Ash for um, community information sessions and uh, where we're at. Been a lot of activity um, and emails and outreach around the hardships. And so we, uh, the Community Connections Violence Prevention Team worked with finance and forestry, as you're aware, to host uh, four um, community information sessions, one virtual and then two or uh, three in person and uh, had about 40 people that engaged uh, in those sessions. And some of the themes we heard back, questions around the process of the identification, the EAB identification, how things are assessed and the costs associated with the removals, um, what are outreaches, uh, treatment options, um, hardship process and other resources, uh, and then some legislative support for relief that questions about that and some uh, questions around the systemic inequities. And so uh, we were able to provide a lot of information in the sessions. We also heard a lot of stuff that we're looking at in terms of like our, how we're doing our outreach and looking at some of our processes there. Um, but we also learned in this process um, early that the city actually has a, a program that we weren't aware of, uh, which was a 0% interest loan um, through their housing department. And we also had Habitat for Humanity. Uh, they also connected us with Habitat for Humanity, which has like a grant program. So these were two uh, potential funding sources for folks that we weren't aware of and being able to promote. We were aware of Metro Blooms having um, some money and they were giving grants. But we see these as opportunities to help promote those programs and help to connect people. Um, we also, there was around the legislation, so currently in session, um, there's funding um, and there's been some lobbying at the state legislature to include an increase in funding that would be eligible for grants to homeowners to help uh, with the costs of private tree removal. And so Pamela Gogemeyer uh, has been tracking that and following that. Um, Currently, there is additional funding in both the House budget and the Senate budget that they met today, I think was their first meeting, where they're gonna to start to kind of reconcile that language. But uh, there is language in there for the state to increase uh, funding uh, that could be used to um, help homeowners. And what that would look like, we believe, is that we would, the Park Board could then apply for the grant to then distribute those funds to homeowners. So that's, but that's a down the road thing. That's, you know, a year from now, we might have that money and a program in place. So the other thing that's worth mentioning is the, Dr. Stephanie Barrage, the state's um, first uh, chief equity officer, uh, attended the first in-person meeting and um, she was excited, uh, followed up with us um, to kind of get her hands around, her head and hands around the, the challenge that we're facing. Um, we were able to share with her everything that we've been doing, how the process works, and she uh, then has engaged or is convening a group of the city and uh, the Habitat for Humanity and the Park Board, um, looking for other partners here too. I know there's been some conversations at the county, but basically, the state equity office looking to convene the people who have money and who have programs, getting us to work together in a way that we can make people aware of these programs and connect them. And so um, that's kind of what's happened in the last uh, week, or week or two since April 12th, and we'll stay on that. And then I will turn it back over to Julie where she will share more about what we can do internally. Uh, Good evening, commissioners, President Forney, Vice President Smith. So um, just a reminder, uh, a couple of years ago, we expanded our financial hardship policies. Uh, so this slide is a slide that we utilized um, during that time. And I just wanna remind us and kind of ground us in the conversation that homestead properties, there is a significant difference about who is able to pay for their tree removals and who have who are the property owners that have to utilize 
the levying process to pay for their tree removals. So you'll see in, uh, obviously in lower income areas, there's a larger percentage of people who use the levying process uh, for the private property tree removals. So this again is a slide that we used uh, back in, in 2021. Uh, information that we heard for, for people who have the ability to pay, uh, this process works really well for them, right? Um, and they're happy to utilize the park board so that they don't have to deal with uh, the tree removals themselves. Seniors and those on fixed incomes um, experience the greatest hardship when it comes to tree removals. Uh, if you have medical bills and related issues, that increases your burden. First time home homeowners are really caught by surprise by these types of obligations. So that's kind of where that outreach and different things uh, can come in. Um, and then property owners that already have assessments on their property. The difficulty with emerald ash borer is how it spreads and it could be infest, it can, will have a tree that we condemn in a, in a property and there's other ash trees on that property. So we don't condemn the tree until it's showing signs of infestation. And so property owners are experiencing multiple trees being condemned over a period of years as, as those trees um, become more um, infested. And there's also street paving, you know, that happens. So property owners mm -hmm. that are facing street assessments and also tree assessments are experiencing more hardship. And then the number and the size of condemned trees um, um, increases the burden. And we do understand that, that the cost of the trees have been increasing. And then the new item that I've added on here that we heard in our community information sessions is that the 10-year term doesn't go far enough and is still considered a hardship for some property owners. So we participate in the City of Minneapolis Deferment Program for Special Assessments. This is a specific program where there's criteria that you have to meet in order to be able to do this. It's for uh, people who are 65 or older, people who are retired or military who are on active duty. This does not forgive the assessment. The assessment is still levied. It becomes a lien against your property and it accumulates interest until that um, assessment is paid in full. And the payment in full is required when the house is either sold, is no longer homestead status, or the hardship disappears. It works well for those who qualify, but I, also, I have ev even seniors who don't want to do this program because there's, it, it will cost them more in the end. And so, um, and so when we did the resolution, we provided a 10-year term so people could choose. Our standard um, assessment is levied over five years. The majority of property owners are utilizing the five-year option, but they also have a 10-year option. And by this amendment that's before you today, it would um, expand it even further and provide a 20 year option. So I have um, seen assessments that are as small as, you know, $100 because it's a tree that's in a condominium area and it's split between many property owners. And I've seen assessments as large as $17,000 for a private property tree removal. So you can see that um, a 20 year option might be more um, reasonable for, for that. And it also allows seniors, if they would choose those options, to be paying on their assessment over time rather than deferring it until the time they sell their property. 
so both options would be a minister and offered administratively during the assessment process we are prepared to make this option available immediately uh, if it should pass uh, the um, pass the board this evening and we would update our financial hardship materials and include the 20-year option and begin mailing um, those out with the billing notices and updating our website and everywhere else that those those options are available to the public any questions Commissioner Schaefer I just wondered where the interest rate landed I know you said previously it was three percent but you were looking at five plus uh, President Forney and uh, uh, Commissioner Schaefer uh, the current interest rate for 2023 was set by the city um, the, it's based on how the bonds are sold and the estimated interest rate of those bonds and the city of Minneapolis has set that interest rate at 3.87 percent this year so it did rise from 3 percent to 3.87 percent but is still uh, fairly reasonable in today's market. Commissioner Mans. Thank you, President Forney. Um, what? How many people like don't pay on time? I mean, do we do we count that, or does it just go? It just is assessed on their property and just counts as their escrow. Um, President Forney, Commissioner Mens. Um, the property assessment is collected by Hennepin County and it's paid off through the property tax assessment process. So, so if, it's, if they pay their property taxes through their mortgage, their mortgage will go up a little bit to cover that special assessment. If they pay their property taxes directly, they will have, you know, pay it off in full or the two payment option. I'm sorry, um, Commissioner um, Musich. Thank you, President Forney. Uh, Director Wiseman, is that interest rate reset annually when the bonds are sold and the um, city understands what the interest rate is on them? Uh, President Forney and Commissioner Musich, it, it resets annually, but for that, for the levy, if we levy in 2023, it's a fixed rate that stays with that assessment over the five, 10 or 20 year period. You predicted my second question. So thank you for that comprehensive answer. <laughs> Seeing no other lights, um, I'll, Commissioner Alper. Thank you, President Forney. Um, I don't I don't have any questions I just I, I guess I kind of just feel torn about this um, because in essence what we're doing is just uh, in some ways um, all we're 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 giving a um, a loan that a person has to pay off and just has more time to pay it off but but that means they have more time with this debt so we're not actually solving the the issue as I see it with this. Um, I mean, I hope that if we pass this tonight, that do, that doesn't mean that we won't keep striving to do things related to the 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 problem, which I don't see as the length of the the term. I see the problem is that we've determined that. Emerald, removing emerald ash borer is a public benefit, but have, have are not allow, we are putting the burden on private homeowners. So um, we've determined it's, um, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of another place where we would go onto somebody's private property and condemn, condemn something and then if, if they don't pay it off in a certain amount of time, we would charge them for it. So it just seems very, very um, somehow un-American <laughs> to do that. Not, uh, not that, I, that I don't think we should do it. I just think we should have another option that assists people with staying in their homes. I mean, 
Um, so I'm not opposed, but I hope that we continue working on this. Um, as I came here today, I passed by Franklin um, and Cedar, and it's like deja vu all over again. There's, a, there's another homeless encampment in the middle of the strip down Franklin, you know, that was there. It's just a revolving problem. So I just don't think that a 20 year uh, repayment plan is gonna solve the issue for people who can't pay. So that's all I have to say, thanks. Thank you, so just two things. Uh, first of all, um, <laughs> Council Rice uh, did weigh in and the last uh, motion is tabled. So that was, and um, I would like to have um, lobbyists, right, uh, speak to um, this um, resolution. If you can update us, please. Um, yes, I can. I think maybe I'll speak as both Attorney Rice and Lobbyist Rice. Um, and uh, the, uh, the President is correct. As Parliamentarian Rice, the, the ruling is that the four to two to two vote, it, the motion to table does pass. And just so commissioners know, when you abstain, in this case, your vote does not count to the, the number. That's an interesting question, because under Robert's rules of order, it's different, but we have a charter provision that says the opposite. That's why I had to check everything. But on the question of, first, legally, let me say this. this is, I understand that the board has been receiving a number of emails on this topic. I've been copied two on them. Uh, there's been inquiries from other units of government about how this works. I've worked with uh, Ms. Wiseman, uh, Superintendent, uh, the staff, Mr. Barrick. Um, I am absolutely comfortable that the staff is doing everything that they should be doing in the context of Minnesota law. The Park Board was given the authority uh, to, uh, and the direction by the legislature to comply with the Department of Agriculture's rules regarding uh, pests, and emerald ash borer is a pest. It's not a tree disease like Dutch elms. It, it's an actual invasive pest that kills ash trees. And under state law, um, it, it falls to this board to adhere to the state law in terms of dealing with that uh, pest. And the this board has probably, unlike some other places, has, has been in the forefront of dealing with it. Um, and uh, you've dealt with it uh, almost ex on public property through having property taxpayers pay for the removal of trees. Now the disease has continued to show up on private property and you're following the law in that regard. Um, you're following the inspections in that regard. You're making available that you can under state law the ability to have the government initially, if, if a homeowner chooses to, they can have the uh, tree removed and then the cost assessed. I understand that there are homeowners who are still um, very challenged to make these requirements or, or to, to remove a tree and it can be expensive. But it's, um, it's simply a, a fact of life that's going to continue to happen in other cities throughout the state. It started in southeastern Minnesota, and it started in, in Minneapolis like 15 years ago as a lobbyist. I'll switch to that. We have worked on this issue for at least 15 years. I remember testifying at the legislature, and a, a former uh, colleague of mine, Kirk Peterson, uh, who's now working for Hennepin County. Um, I remember in 2006, I believe, he testified on this because Kurt kind of became our in-house expert on it as from a lobbying perspective. And everybody looked at him like, you've got to be kidding me. There's, they, they, I would say they laughed at him. They said, well, this isn't happening. It's real. It happens. And these trees get infected and they die. They fall apart. I had a neighbor who had the same uh, problem uh, over northeast and was it I need I should know more that what the trees look like I said that tree looks like it needs to be trimmed he had a tree person come out and said you're gonna have to take it down because it's about to fall apart so it's very real in, in as to the question about what aid can the government uh, provide to a private uh, something that is on private property at this point, we have not been able to identify the authority that the Park Board has to spend money in that area. We have this session, talk to our legislators, 
talked to representative jordan uh, representative hansen from south st paul has put money aside in a relief program uh, statewide of twenty million dollars to address emerald ash borer and he's put nine million in for the metropolitan parks to address it we have tried to talk to him about possibly setting up an assistance fund but it, Im it implicates a much larger issue there are literally hundreds of millions of ash trees most of them are concentrated in northeastern minnesota but and and much of that property is public property but there are certainly private properties everywhere and the legislature is um trying to get their uh collective heads around it too to say is there sufficient money to provide aid to you know persons and i think the case that the staff has been making the case that we've been making in certain areas, areas of concentrated uh, poverty, areas that don't have the proper tree canopy, it's particularly important to try to address those uh, communities. But uh, I just have to say it's been a challenge legislatively. Um, the issue has rapidly evolved as the session's gone on. I'm not sure, I'd have to talk to Ms. Uh, Gokemeyer if we have actually formally have a legislative position on it but I will tell the board that we have been working on it since the early days of the session uh, raising it uh, to people and I've reached out to some of the legislators it, it, several of the legislators trying to say can we do this but it, it the, the question becomes kind of a precedential one in nature if the state sets it up uh, um, what happens I miss Wiseman I'll just add to that I know that she had told me the Apparently, there's been one city in Nebraska that used federal money to uh, um, ARPA money to, to deal with the question. So I believe we're trying to talk to the city uh, to see whether or not that's a possible resource too. So um, there's uh, it's it's an evolving situation, and the, it certainly has the attention of the superintendent and the staff and the lobbyists. Thank you. Parliamentarian Council and lobbyist Rice. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bene. Yes, um, I just briefly, I wanted to say that I'll, I'll be supporting this because I, I like that we're having, I think what, you know, maybe a politician would call a multi-prong approach. I think that's really important. There's a lot of different angles. And, you know, I think we're thinking of the, the you know, so, some of the circumstances that are the, the most dire for certain homeowners in our city, but as Ms. Wiseman said, there are sometimes occasionally a really high assessment of very expensive tree to remove, and this might help people in a broader category of income as well. Um, and then well, I have a question for Ms. Wiseman, because you brought up the other assessments, and I, I thought, oh, that's a little different, though. So this is about assessing on a, a private, privately owned tree on a private property, on a city street paving project, sidewalks, that the city will um, assess, right? That's correct. Uh, President Forney, <laughs> Commissioner Abeni, that is correct. But uh, if for street trees, for boulevard trees, do we do any assessments there? Uh, Commissioner, or President Forney, Commissioner Abeni, we do not. Okay, so that's kind of, to me, that's a little bit of an important distinction. So this program does not include that kind of assessment that a person might get for a, a roughed up sidewalk, a damaged sidewalk, or a street paving project, or a re reconstruction project which is what I'm having at my house um, now. So I think that um, I think that's also helps me kind of frame this and, and you know, add this to the toolkit. Thank you. Commissioner Mintz. Thank you, President Forney. Um, thank you, Council Rice, for that explanation. So I, I, th I will be supporting this. I think it's a temporary solution or, a, or very uh, important for currently. But I think that what Commissioner Benny said, the multi-pronged approach, and with the resolution that we did not agree to hear, that's part of that. that. That the intention was to give some credence to the legislative committee and to direct funding to an area that we know has a lower tree canopy and to sort of command the state to take notice of that. We have done our job. We have removed public emerald ash borer. The state is now deciding that they're going to fund that. Like, We've done our job. This, the city taxpayers did that. Like, so how do we, and I, and I commend um, Lobbyist Rice for you know, making that a priority at the state level and that there are precedents, but how do we as a board act and let people know that this is something that we can do legislative, that we can put on notice that we need money 
for something that is a public health crisis in our city, but we've taken care of the part that you all haven't yet. So I, I hope that we do take that multi-pronged approach, and I hope that we do find ways to forgive these loans and to really relieve people for where they need relief. Because a $5,000 tree assessment is one thing over 20 years, but then you have another one and another one. I mean, there's possibility of losing three trees. And then you think about your property value going down because you don't have trees. So I, I just think that thank you for taking the multi-pronged approach, and thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. So I don't see any more lights. So on the resolution, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I can't make sure I got to say that now. Uh, okay, that action carries. So on to our next resolution, which is actually a presentation. Um, we have, oh, and by the way, I need to uh, mention to everybody that I failed to say that the uh, discussion item of 2023-31 will not be had because unfortunately our presenter, senior planner, uh, Carrie Christensen is ill. So um, Director Wiseman again. Oh, and Assistant Superintendent, sure. Uh, good evening, President Forney and commissioners. Uh, I'm happy to present or begin presenting the NPP 20, 2022 annual report. That's a lot of twos. Uh, you have a hard copy in front of you. Uh, the copy of the report it will also be available online. So our 20 year neighborhood park plan, our annual report, uh, we have uh, done kind of a revamping, redesign, and um, uh, kind of consolidating of the report. So I'm excited to kind of go over those, those changes. Uh, the biggest change is at the end of the report, we now have a reference list rather than all of uh, the documents as an appendix. So, if you're online, these are um, linked reference lists. So if there's something you want to see in history, you can click on it and it will take you there. Uh, it also have, has links to all the, the previous years. Uh, and this report is uh, the sixth of our 20 years of reports. So in the executive summary, it, it just provides uh, the background around the 20 year neighborhood park plan and our historic agreement with the city of Minneapolis that has provided additional funding for our neighborhood parks. It also talks about the ordinances uh, that establish the funding as well as the criteria based system for capital and uh, rehab parks. Um, our current NPP 20 funding, so this report covers three years. Uh, we have our property tax levy allocation that supports our operations, maintenance, and repairs. That funding uh, increases annually based on our property tax, um, our property tax increase uh, to the general fund. It's housed in the general fund. Uh, and you'll see the three years of general fund uh, dollars there. We also have our capital and rehab, which is shown on uh, the right. And the blue portion is the capital investment and the green portion is uh, the rehab uh, portion. So our annual report is required within the NPP 20 ordinance and it uh, provides key financial data in accordance, uh, in accordance with um, that ordinance. Our overall operating costs, 20, our NPP 20 expects to improve efficiencies and costs based on increased maintenance, which over time uh, will maximize the service life of park assets, reduce backlogs for repairs and rehab, 
and um, it will mean that more assets are consistently available to the public. And we are also experiencing some cost savings from investments in energy efficient uh, materials. So we negotiated our guaranteed annual minimum amount. Uh, we need to negotiate that every five years. So you'll see there are increases for 2022 to 2026, where we started at 10 and a half million. We now have 11 and a half million going up to 13.1. And that's to account for construction inflation and inflation in material and supplies. Our capital improvement program is adopted, of, of course, during our annual budget process. We have a six-year CIP. We utilize the equity ordinance. Uh, and we expect that all neighborhood parks will, with major amenities will benefit from the first round of improvements prior to the conclusion of the NPP 20. I'll turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. Thank you, uh, Director Weisman, and uh, President Forney, I'm sure you'll stop me when we get to 6.30 for the public meeting. Um, I have several slides to go through, and I'll try to move through them fairly directly and allow you to come back and ask questions, because most times when I go through this, there are questions. Uh, the first one slide here, and the first several slides really relate to the rehab program um, that was set up, and, and it lists on the left portion of the page the goals, um, and I think it's really most important to focus on the last dot point there that identifies the that we're, we're focusing on those features that are most need of repair or replacement. The rehabilitation program is intended to get parks through that period until their time comes up in the capital program. So uh, it's really important that there are assets that are being uh, paid attention to through this program. Um, and, and as we get to the, to the list on the right, when we look at prioritizing rehab projects, we look at uh, things like condition, um, program use, um, the, the, the master plan and the available funding, and particularly the master plan, uh, because we don't want to be replacing or rehabilitating a, a, an asset that will be replaced in one or two years. So these are the rehabilitation categories um, on the left portion of the page here. And as you read across, this is for 2021. When you read across, there's the, the budgeted amount, the allocated amount. Um, and then the, eventually you get to the point where you say amount not drawn down in the third column from the left. And I want, I'm going to be focusing on that as we go through because that's where most of the questions come from. So from 2021, the amount not drawn down is significant in the operations facilities category. And that's because we are trying to build up a fund where we can actually do a major project using these funds and other funds that, uh, that are coming through to deal with operations centers. This is like we use these when we would be upgrading South Side or Hiawatha Tool, those kind of facilities. So we have spent some dollars from this category, but really we're trying to build up enough so that we can actually do a major project um, and improve a, a, a one, of the op one or more of the operations facilities. 2022, um, you'll, you'll see that this, this has got more projects in that category, but it's important that this was done, that this, this was recording things that were done at the end of 2022. <laughs> and when we look at this, this list, particularly in like in the first category, where we have $535,000 in the amount not, draw, not drawn down. Um, that doesn't include projects like Nokomis and Van Cleve, which have been uh, completed now. And this may actually include dollars that will be directed to Luxton as we make improvements for the Spark Studio. We are required by code to make improvements to ADA uh, systems in the building. Also, as we go through all of these things, and it's important that we are coordinating with the recreation programs. We don't want to step in and close a rec center down to do an ADA uh, improvement project. So we're working closely with rec staff to get ourselves aligned uh, around the, the program year and try and make sure these have as least impact as possible um, as we move through the, the, the whole program. Then you get to 2023, and you can see that most of the dollars in this category are not drawn down uh, because we haven't really started projects uh, intensively yet. But this, this will similarly uh, move down as we move through the, a, a program year. Uh, I'm going to stop you. Perfect time to stop because I'll break on the capital project. project. <laughs> great, great. So I'm going to re uh, recess the full board and move to the planning committee since we have um, a public hearing um, at 6.30 time certain. So 
Thank you, President. Thank you, President Forney. Um, uh, it's, I'm noting it's 6:30, and I'd like to cl call the Planning Committee to order. Secretary, will you please take the roll? Commissioner Thompson here. Commissioner Schaefer here. Commissioner Olson absent. Co-chair El Elper <coughs> here. Co-chair Benny here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Would somebody move the agenda for approval, please? I will move the agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The agenda is approved. Um, next are some one set of minutes to move. Would somebody move them? I will move the planning committee minutes of March 15th, 2023. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the agenda um, minutes, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The uh, minutes are approved. Um, okay, so we do have a, um, a public hearing, but we have also an, an action item associated with the public hearing tonight. And so uh, Ms. Downey, Ms. Uh, Downey's here to give us a presentation to kick off the uh, public comment. So with that, Good evening, Planning Committee, Co-Chairs Alper and Co-Chair Benny. Um, we have before us Resolution 2022-3112, and it's a resolution adopting the updated Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board land policy. <coughs> Woohoo! I'm a little excited. Just <laughs> <laughs> First, I want to just go through a little bit of the timeline. It's been a few years since this began, so this is just a little bit of free summary. So um, the current policy was actually um, last looked at in 2015. It was due for um, review and for renewal in 2020. So in 2019, um, we did the community engagement plan, found that it was to be at the consult level, consulting the public for their, for their input and feedback. We formed a policy team, and that was made up of an internal work group. <coughs> and from 2019 to 21, of course, there's COVID in between there. And we met three times and drafted the first draft of the updated Minneapolis and the NPRB land policy. In November of 2021, after drafting that first initial draft, um, <coughs> we went to the board and asked that to um, have authorization to have a minimum 60 days public comment or public review um, time for them to have their comment and fill out surveys and, and provide feedback. In January of 22, 2022, that's when we presented to the first to this board a uh, discussion item regarding this particular policy, and we were still actually still in the comment period, and that was didn't actually expire until. Um, March of 2022. So from the time that comment period closed in March of 2022 until fall of 2022, we were tabulating the surveys and all the feedback that we received um, and then integrated all those changes into that draft and updated the policy. And then, of course, fall of 2022 is when we asked that it be placed on the agenda. And this brings us to the current review. So I just wanted, and this is part of my excitement. So the current um, NPRB land policy is, as you can see, just in substance, about two pages long. <laughs> and as you, as I probably might have remembered from, it's been a little bit over a year since I last presented regarding this. Um, what you have before you now is actually 13 pages worth of substance. So you can imagine how much more of that how much time and effort went into that and feedback that we um, actually integrated into this. Um, I think part of my presentation in January of 2022 um, explained to you that there, was, there were things that we removed from the policy that was actually not really relevant and then things that we actually added and we felt were actually needed to be included in the policy. Um, just an overall um, explanation of the policy organization. Of course, the beginning portion is the policy statement, and, and it concludes with six guiding policy statements. They're actually enumerated. Um, this next section is definitions, and that's just to make sure that we are providing 
policy and agency consistency on the definition of terms that are being used in the policy and elsewhere. And then, then third, there are four separate um, sections, land acquisition, land disposition, land use and stewardship and encroachments. And they all begin with a very short policy summary and then are followed by a pro um, procedure summary, different sections. Um, and so, I hope this helps a little bit. This is, this graphic will show you from the initial draft, as I said, um, <coughs> went to the public for comment until now, the one that's before you, there were a number of things that went into the, the document and the things that we actually used in order to <coughs> come up with the, this final updated version. Of course, the, the community engagement, um, there were public surveys that were completed online and on the web page. We had a project plan, I mean project plan or policy actually project page on the web on the web page website. We also had key partners that we directly emailed and asked for their impact. And then we also actually sent out survey, I mean postcards reminding them people who were directly impacted by Parkland, asking them to fill out surveys. And then, of course, this is just a reference to the presentation to this board. Um, and from that meet, from that particular board meeting, we wrote down the comments that came from you, the commissioners, and then we also received emails from that date, and we incorporated information from both those sources. Excuse me. Um, and then the, all, the third portion, or place that we received feedback and incorporated into this actually, into this um, policy of presentations that we did to the superintendent's leadership and executive teams. And they were allowed to, we presented the policy and they gave us feedback and things that they thought should be changed or modified or added. And then as we received all these things and incorporated, added, subtracted. We, as the team, discussed them and made changes to the document if necessary. And then at the end of that course, asked legal counsel to make sure that we were on board with making sure that, the, that it was state statute, with the park board ordinance, so that we didn't have any inconsistency. <clears throat> These are just a few um, Numerical, numerical statistics, um, the numbers, it looks like a very small amount. I'll be honest with you, I was pretty shocked, but I didn't know what to expect, actually. <laughs> so the um, survey was open from basically November, end of November until the middle of March, of end of November 2021, until the middle of March 2022. Um, as I said before, it was a minimum of 60 days was the initial um, authorization and we for, of course extended it based on the holidays and on COVID of course which was still in <laughs> still happening so um, as I noted before there were key partners that we sent emails to directly um, they were governmental organizations um, Minneapolis public schools developers public utilities and so of those, there were some that responded, looks great, <laughs> but there were two that actually gave us some substantive information and changes that they thought should go into the, to the draft. Yeah. So um, in the tabulation of the public, the survey and the comments and the themes, there were actually a total number of about 85 comment themes that we went through and actually in, in the, terms of this policy draft. <clears throat> so um, I've not chosen all of them. We didn't do all 85, but these are just a few of the major things. And um, the first I wanted to note was suggesting to, uh, there were a few uh, survey complete, who, people who completed the survey that suggest that we allow public transit on parkways. Um, the way that our team responded to that feedback theme is that we modify the policy to acknowledge both the state statute and of course ordinance um, and we created a pathway to transit on parkways. 
next is suggestion. Um, major thing that came from the public comment period is suggesting to include language about climate change. Uh, the policy was modified to include in the policy statement um, language about climate change as additional purpose, as an additional purpose of the parks, our parks. Um, next is the suggestion was a major thing. A major thing was su they suggested to include indigenous acknowledgement. And our response was the policy statement was modified to reference NPRB stewardship over the word ownership. And that sort of was a major mind, mind um, change you know, mental way of thinking of it. I think when we all think of property, we think of ownership. That's the first word we think of, I own. And um, the word stewardship, I, we of course thought was much more appropriate, especially given the history of the land. We also include language, um, a really strong statement in one of the six guiding policy statements. Um, next, the suggestion to strengthen equity language. The policy was modified to include acknowledgement of historic inequities in multiple places and also our efforts to dismantle those inequities. And then last, from the public comment period, a major theme was that there was concern that acquisitions are not subject to community engagement policy. This is one which we didn't modify the policy, but we noted that the reason why we didn't, we didn't make the change is that it would significantly limit staff's ability to act, uh, act quickly and acquire needed parkland because in most cases, we need to move pretty quickly and when, those, when land becomes available or if someone's offering land, we don't have like a six or one year process, one year's time to actually to move on that. And all acquisitions are made public through the board once they are actually um, negotiated. Here is a, um, I wanted to kind of go over the things that we gleaned from your comments from the January 20, 2022 presentation, also from the emails that we received from commissioners. And I wanted to know the major themes that we received and how we responded to those. So one of them, uh, major themes from that feedback was the suggestion to include language regarding acquisition of natural lands. <clears throat> Excuse me, the policy was modified to reflect this suggestion, and in the section uh, of land acquisition, we modified it to include phrases like increase and enhance habitat for wildlife and wildlife corridors. Next, there was a suggestion to tie a policy statement to the mission. It is throughout the document in which we modified this to reflect this suggestion, and language is added where the mission and values is connected to this policy. Next, the suggestion to include indigenous acknowledgement. I wanted to include this because I wanted to make sure you understood that there was a little bit of um, duplication from what the public was saying and also what the commissioners were saying. And so, of course, it's identical to what we did in, when, on the last slide. We modified to reference our stewardship over ownership and also that we have in our six, one of our six guiding policy statements, very strong language regarding that. And then last, um, there was a suggestion that <clears throat> for land acquisition guidance, the criteria be based on the comp plan, and that should be just on the comp plan that, and that should change. And as a result, uh, we, we modified the policy to reflect the suggestion and changed it to not only comp plan, also the ecological system plan and other applicable plans. I am um, in the last, I'm actually in this resolution, I have noted some of the key policy changes, changes to the policy from the initial draft until now. But I wanted to highlight them again because I don't know that everyone even in the public knows exactly what some of the major policy, some of the changes have been made to this policy since it was first um, put out for public comment. So mission and values, under that, there are clear statements regarding policy alignment with NPRB's mission and values. It's throughout the document. Natural resources, wildlife and plants, addition of language 
um, has been done throughout the <clears throat> throughout that includes both natural resources like wildlife and plants as major influences. Indigenous people's acknowledgement. There are, of course, I noted that before we've added that. Uh, NPRB's existing plans and environmental goals. Land language was added to ensure that, ensure that NPRB's existing plans and environmental goals are considered where applicable. Due diligence and land acquisitions. Um, due diligence clause was added to the land acquisition section. Contingent purchase agreements permitted by the board. Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that that was also allowed by the board resolution referenced in the land acquisition section. Public utilities definition. Um, that has been a little bit fuzzy, but one of the things we did to this, in this document was to make sure that was clearly defined and made sure that it was um, consistent with the Minnesota state statute. Public transit use statute language. Um, this section was added again to make sure it was consistent with state statute language and also with the park board ordinance. And then last, which is my favorite subject, encroachment violation timelines. Um, we have a commitment for in the policy for staff to maintain a public document, so there would be no question, um, showing timelines for addressing violations and having this requirement while not including the actual timelines in the policy, it allows for the flexibility over time while still guiding staff in violation timelines. Um, this, requir was, this requirement was added to encroachment sections. Um, I just want to add one last thing about encroachments. Um, I think one of the things that we have in planning and going along uh, in using practices and being consistent, the encroachment um, policy section of this land policy is really sort of important in that it gives the, the public on notice this is exactly what the board has you know, adopted and how it feels about how things should go and really encroachments they're either licensed or they're not. And if they're not licensed, they should be. So um, I just probably put that in there as a little side. <laughs> and that's the end of my presentation. Hey, thank you. Um, we'll maybe uh, have you back up for questions after the public hearing. But with that, I would like to open the public hearing. Um, we have one person that signed up to speak, but before I call you, um, the I, actually I see you, and I think you were in the room when we um, read the rules before. So um, I, I think the only thing that I'll point out is that we'll, um, since we have only one speaker signed up and one written comment, we'll do three minutes for the uh, the time. So with that, I'd like to open the public hearing and uh, call Mark Mike Forcia to the. Um, podium. Hello again. My name is Mike Forsha, uh, chairman of the American Indian Movement. Um, we've spoken before. Uh, actually, you've listened before. I've tried to make appointments with uh, Superintendent Ben Gore, but never get any response from him or his staff. Um, I've spoken to you for the last year and a half or so. Uh, we've had more deaths at the encampments. Uh, we had three of them removed today and yesterday. And you acknowledge that you sit on 6,000 plus acres of stolen Dakota land. And you want to put $80,000 to acknowledge it. But what will you do to help my people who are suffering? Is there anything that you can do? Mr. Rice here said it's something that they should look into, but all I've been hearing is um, cha-ching, cha-ching. How much money? How much money are we gonna get for East Phillips Park? That's our land, you say. And then we have to argue about 18 holes at Hiawatha, 95 acres for those men to put a little tiny ball in those little holes while my people are dying in the street. 
I don't know what more we can do, what more we can ask of you. We have support. Midtown Phillips neighborhood supports us. They were willing to give us 80,000 last year to start building the homes. East Phillips Park uh, neighborhood supports us. Uh, we got five city council members supporting us. But why won't you? Why won't you support us? It's only six acres of land and we can eliminate the encampments immediately. We can close them down. We could save lives. Um, I had a friend, Lake in, Hi Lake in Hiawatha. They found him, he was poisoned by fentanyl. And up in Leech Lake, we buried him a couple of weeks ago. And my nephew, Isaac, fentanyl poisoning again. This one happened up on the res. And my, my community is in a state of perpetual mourning. And how to get you to understand, and you want to uh, acquire more land and do it fast, more land, more land. What can we do to get you to give us six acres of land? Don't even give it to us, borrow it to us. Borrow us that land, we can transform our people because treatment isn't working for us. Western style treatment isn't working. Um, you have blood on your hands, just so you know. Thank you. Um, Secretary, will you read the other uh, comment? Honestly, uh, it is all so simple in my book, and current land discussions need to be joined with Native American knowledge and voices, a journey that starts with building relationships. There is much joy on this path, and we will all be better for it, especially the land. Kate Clemens Tuma, non-native, on the task force of We Are Still Here, Minnesota, run by Ramona Quito Stately. Ideas to start with. Watch the documentary stories I didn't know as an introduction to our area, which delves into current collaborative efforts. Find out more about the Friends of the Fall and the St. Anthony Falls Project now run by Native American Shelley Buck. Download Revelo AR and experience Marlena Miles' argumented, oh, sorry, augmented reality exhibits by Bruce Vento Sanctuary as promoted in the current Visit St. Paul Guide. Visit Marlena Miles Dakota land maps on the second floor 10, uh, 10 foot by 10 foot canvas printed at the Hamlin Law School, St. Kate's Library, and the Starbucks on, on Standard and Snelling. Download your own free copy from Mar Marlena Miles' website. Look up Wakan Tipi, newly named, used by the Lower Failing Creek Project, now by Native Maggie Lorenz. Read the Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People. Visit Birch Bark Books in Minneapolis, one amazing one-stop shop in our midst. There is much more going on. Stay up to date and have fun learning. We do know that we all live on Dakota land. This is no secret now. Thank you. And with that, I'll close the uh, public hearing. And I think we can move um, back to the topic at hand. We have one action item. So would somebody on the committee move the resolution? Yes, I would like to move Resolution 2022-312, resolution adopting the updated Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board land policy. Thank you. Um, so is there, is there any discussion? I see Commissioner Schaefer. Yes, I had a question. If you could direct me in the document, if there's anywhere that you talk about temporary and permanent easement fees, any direction around that? I see a little bit of direction on page eight, number four. And I see on page, but it doesn't say, it just says they may create a record of permanent and temporary easements with private and government entities. But it doesn't talk about easement fees. But then you talk about permit fees in number six, that construction permit fees may be waived by staff. Um, but you don't talk about easement fees. So I'm just wondering if I missed it. And I'm sorry, I'm just, I would have gotten, this, gotten you this question earlier if it would have 
come across my mind? Uh, Co-chair Zabini and Alper, um, Co-chair Schaefer. Um, can you direct me to the section you were on again? Page eight of the um, printed document, or the document, um, number four. Is it under Easements to third parties. Is it under land use and stewardship, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay. I just think if we're talking about fees around waiving permit fees for permits, um, I think we should maybe figure out what's our process for easement fees um, because it seems like sometimes we charge them, sometimes we don't. Um, I think in most cases for easements, we tip it. I've not seen where we've not evaluated or calculated a fee. There's been in some cases where there have been betterments, which are like right. um, the substitution for, for cash, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, I guess in my tenure, I don't know that we've given easements without a fee having been calculated and therefore somehow either being paid for okay. or somehow um, given compensation with betterments of something. Sort. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, perhaps. Well, I, this is, I'm just bringing this point up now and maybe we can bring some clarity next time around. Um, but I just would like to know staff's perspective on if we should add a sentence in there about what is our general direction around easement fees. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, uh, Chair of any Commissioner Schaefer. Um, I, I think if there's a desire for, for more detail around the easement fees, that's certainly something we can explore um, in the intervening time between this meeting and sure. potentially yeah. a full board meeting. Um, if, there, if um, any commissioners, um, including yourself, have specific ideas for kind of what we want to be saying in the policy about easement fees, um, I think it would be good for us to hear that as we craft a potential amendment or, or an, an expansion of some of the policy language. Um, so definitely um, reach out to Christine um, and or myself uh, in the intervening time so that we can um, make sure that uh, um, your expectations for the um, final version are met. Or if you see somewhere else in the document that I've missed that addressed it, um, you could let me know yeah, that we'll, too. Um, Commissioner Benny, uh, Chair Benny, Commissioner Schaefer, we'll take a closer look at the document um, yeah. and, uh, and see if, um, what fee language we have in there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Co-Chair Elper. Thank you. I just would like to first, first and foremost, express um, my gratitude uh, to Christine Downey for, and other staff um, for being involved in this process and for putting up, quite frankly, with um, myself and Co-Chair Benny uh, over the last year. So I do want to say um, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. We we are going to. We are going to pass this thing. So um, it, it will get done and there will be a celebration after, I, I hope. Um, so, the, but the, I think what I would really like to express um, to colleagues here today is that um, we've both, uh, Commissioner Abeni and I have tried to be very thoughtful um, with this, looking at it and I, um, I would say I poured over the ordinance or what's in ordinance and what's in the the policy document before you tonight and um, I, I think I've been in discussion with with Adam and Christine and plan to you know keep working on it over the next couple of weeks um, but we just I, I in the uh, trying to be timely I put forward this resolution and I'd like to explain it um, or this amendment so if it's okay I'd like to move this amendment that is before you which adds some language, should I, should I read it out? Yes. Okay, okay. So um, I would like to propose the following amendment that we add uh, where use of parkways where it says um, add the words policy statement and then we would strike the words commercial transit use and I'll, I'll speak to it afterwards with the why. Um, and then this whole piece about public transit use that we would strike those words, but keep where it says public transit system use is, and then strike further, but keep governed by da 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 
and all the way to the end. I hope I don't have to. It's right here. It's right here, I swear. Um, so if, if I may speak to the amendment, uh, Co-Chair Benny? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Do I, do I have more time? Secretary Ringgold? Thank you. All right. So the reason I put for this forward today is because I, I poured over the uh, park board set of ordinances. And if you look at chapter five on buses, it's called buses, literally, and it's taking a little while to open, but there is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from it and just reference this, please. Okay. It says, PB 5-1, policy statement. And then um, I would like you to turn your attention to the words that start after where I have stricken uh, commercial transit use. It says, the parkways and park roads under the jurisdiction of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board were not designed or constructed to accommodate use by buses and commercial vehicles. The Emperor B is not obligated to provide commercial bus transportation routes on its parkways and park roads, blah, 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 blah. So basically this entire first paragraph is, is the policy statement that is in ordinance. So it, I just would like to um, point that out. And then the reason um, I have uh, taken out the public transit use piece is because we could go two ways. Okay, we could, we could put all the detail in about commercial transit use, which it gets really into the weeds. I mean, it talks about application for a permit, the name, the address, you have to you know, share what insurance you have, you have to, you know, um, copies of all the certifications of all buses that will operate under the permit. There's, there's a lot of detail about commercial transit use in the ordinance. That detail is not in this policy, but there's one paragraph about public transit use in the ordinance, and that was literally a, a direct copy paste and put in here, minus the text that is the addition, or that, that is kept. So we've got, um, we've got, uh, what I'm proposing is to make them match in, in scope. So we could, I've basically taken out the detail um, and kept it, kept it high up. But we could go the other route and take all the detail from the ordinance and put that in the policy about commercial transit use, which would then make the public transit use piece meet that level of detail. So nothing has changed. The language of the ordinance is still the ordinance. This public transit, these sentences are still an ordinance. It's still an ordinance. It's just we have removed the detail. So it's just to make, merely make what we're saying in policy, I believe, match the, the strength or the, the level of detail, that's a better word for putting it, that's, that's in ordinance. Make the policy, yeah, match the level of detail. Okay. We're at, we're at two hours. And so maybe that didn't make sense. Please, please feel free to ask me questions. Okay. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Alper. Um, Commissioner Thompson. Thank you very much. Um, well, now Co-Chair Alper's explanation leads me to want to read all the original text, which I have not. I will con concede. Um, but I'm staring at something that says by a two-thirds majority, which seeks to be excised. And I, I don't know if in this moment I can go on the trust that that's also somewhere in an ordinance that sounds like a land use policy board directive that I do not want to relinquish. Um, could, so I don't know. Could I respond to that? Uh, if, 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 sure. Uh, uh, Commissioner Thompson, thanks. That That is an ordinance, and I would ask, could staff confirm that's still an ordinance? Or would, still an ordinance. Thank you, and I appreciate that clarification. Um, I will confess that I, I, I respect what you had just said. I will trust that, and then if we get to the full board and I do more of a deep dive, then things will happen that way. But I'm going to trust that that's the simplification of it all. <laughs> Commissioner Elper, your light's on. Do you? Okay. Um, so we're speaking to the uh, amendment. Uh, any other questions or discussion? Okay. I think with that we could um, move to vote on the uh, Elper amendment. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 
Sorry. Opposed? Late. Opposed? No, uh, that, that amendment now is included, and we're now back to discussing the resolution. Uh, there are questions re um, related to the resolution. Yes, uh, I think you're gonna put your light on, Commissioner, Co-Chair Elper. <coughs> yeah, I think, um, I just would like to say I hope that the staff will come to some. I just would like to say that I hope that, that we can continue in dialogue over the next couple weeks with some of the other potential things that we talked about and perhaps what other people here are interested in um, today, whether they be relatively minor. I, I think it could aid in the understanding of our, I, I mean, I know we're calling it a policy, but it's our procedures around really important topics like um, encro encroachments. Um, and I'm, I, I wanna make sure that um, the public kind of um, know where to go. So I know you referenced some of the making sure that we have the updated um, ordinance system referenced here. So little, little things like that. I think that's all I have. Appreciate it. Commission, Commissioner Schaefer. Yeah, I just had a question. I had a question in regards to the amendment we just put forward from the staff's perspective. Um, if they're exactly the same, why did the staff include them in the land policy? Um, uh, Co-Chair Abeni, Commissioner Schaefer, um, it, sometimes when we're writing policy, you know, there, there actually isn't ordinance support, you know? Um, sometimes there's a lot of ordinance support. Um, and so we didn't want to be completely silent on the topic of parkway use, mm -hmm. but the ordinance piece on parkway use is highly detailed, probably very detailed for a typical ordinance. And so we um, wanted to sort of make a reference to it without completely reinventing the wheel. Just so if you were only reading the land policy, you would gotcha. see that there actually is a lot of information in the ordinance. Um, I actually think that Commissioner Alper's amendment um, is a really good one because it simplifies the policy even further and essentially makes it a cross-reference to an ordinance which is highly detailed in terms of um, the, the operation of that particular part of our work and also makes that concurrent reference to state statute, um, which does really govern um, the transit use on the parkways. And, and I, I feel like I heard two different numbers. Um, you mentioned PB5-1, and this one in the, in the document does not say that ordinance. It um, says PB2007-102. Um, yes, uh, Co-Chair Benny, Commissioner Schaefer, um, there was a renumbering process at some point, and okay. so there actually, <laughs> you can weirdly go on, on the Muni code online, and there's a huge cross-referencing page to what the old ordinance system used to look like and what it looks like today. Um, Council Rice maybe can jump in if I'm getting this wrong, um, but the, the current home for those transit and commercial vehicle on parkways ordinances is the PB chapter five called buses. And so there are maybe a couple of ordinance references that we uh, need to update, uh, which staff will do with a cosmetic amendment before um, this is considered at the full board. And then could we request that on the online version of this that there be direct links to these ordinances when people may wanna go to the land use policy and then click through to this detail around it? That would be helpful. Yeah, Chair Benny, Commissioner Schaefer, that's a great idea. We can work on that after passage of the policy. When we post that publicly, we could work on hyperlinks, yes. Yeah. Great, that's really, that's really helpful. Thank you. Co-Chair Co Elper. Thanks for calling on me again. Um, now I've, of course, forgotten what I was gonna say. PB5-1. PB5-1. Um, oh yeah, thinking. <laughs> two, thinking two, <laughs> I think. One or two. I think the process of looking at this policy, and then looking at our ordinances, makes me think that hey, maybe there's some opportunities to relook at our ordinances. So I hope, you know, maybe maybe that's the direction we we go in. Also, you know, thinking about some of the language, and I don't have the 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 um, land policy before me today exactly, but you know, some of the, some of the language around 
uh, encroachments um, or um, land, ac oh, land acquisition or land disposition. There, it, the ordinances are strangely like, really silent on, on those two topics. So might be something to consider. That's all I have. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions? Okay, well, I just, I just want to uh, say a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> I'm totally support, supporting <laughs> passing this um, because, you know, it, and we, have, uh, as C Commissioner, uh, Co-Chair Elper said, we really appreciate your patience as we kind of worked through it. It's a pretty big document. Um, I would say this. I, I do have a little squishiness about certain things being uh, open to public comment that I'm still not all the way convinced maybe are the, are the right things. Um, technical matters, maybe certain policy decisions. That, that's, a, you know, having this open to the public. I mean, I'm all about transparency and engagement, but sometimes it's a bit much. That being said, though, I looked at the comments, and there was, there was one, I think, where, anyway, I won't, say, I won't quote that one. It was negative. But there were, there were a lot of really nice comments in there, and people putting a lot of thought into um, how this policy really can, you know, protect, protect and preserve our, our land. And I also want to make another comment. You know, sort of, I want to decouple the idea of the, um, the acknowledgment from the change of the use, use of the word ownership and stewardship. Because, I, again, I'm going to say that, to me, that, we do have uh, deeded land that is owned by this, every single resident and citizen of the city of Minneapolis. And it's, that land is held in the commons for the common good. That's a really big deal. It's a really Im important deal. So the, the kind of erosion, kind of the softening of that language in it for touchy-feely reasons, and, and ugh, I don't mean about the acknowledgement. We're going to work on that separately. I just do have, I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think it's necessary. Let's boldly say we hold this land for the residents, the people of Minneapolis. But um, that being said, I think those are all my comments. With, so with that, I would like to um, put this to a vote. So all those in favor of resolution 2022-312, please signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, that passes. So we're going to continue with the planning? Yes, I'm going to suggest that we continue with um, all the planning. Then after that, we'll go to operations. And after that, then we'll go to administration and finance. Because in administration and finance, there are two items that will be coming back to the board if those pass. So um, like I said, we will go in that order, operations after we complete this, and then to admin and finance, just for everybody to know. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, the, the next item, would somebody move um, the next item, resolution 2023-66? I will move resolution 2023-66, resolution approving the installation of two pollinator gardens by Armitage Neighborhood Association and Wash Washburn Avenue tot lot and further approving a license and maintenance agreement for the gardens with the Arbitage Neighborhood Association within the Southwest Service Area of Minneapolis. Thank you. And it looks like uh, Colleen O'Dell is here to make a presentation. I'd love to see a presentation. Um, this is one of the most awesome tot lots in the city. So <laughs> let's see what we've got. <laughs> Chairs of Benny and Alper and commissioners, um, before you have a resolution on pollinator garden installation and license and maintenance agreement at Wash Washburn Avenue tot lot, which as you can see is in the lower southwest corner of the city. So the plan for this uh, park was adopted in 2020 as part of the Southwest Service Area Master Plan. You're looking at it here. And one of the proposed design features is pointed out with the blue arrow, number seven, and that's a naturalized planting with either a boardwalk or a rain garden or something along those lines. So a little background on that. The park board has already done significant play area improvements at this park over uh, two years. So that coupled with the equity ranking for this park, there are no new funds allocated in the current CIP through 2027 at this park. And there's a current staff challenge capacity for, maintain for maintaining new naturalized areas. It's really hard for us uh, to stretch our staff to get those maintained. So the Armitage Neighborhood Association um, quite heroically uh, applied for and received grants from a Board of Water and Soil Resources uh, grant program, which replaces turf grass with pollinator plantings. And they would like to allocate some of that to this park. 
So they work together with staff of planning, horticulture, natural resources, and environmental services to come up with a process to accept the donation of the garden and have their staff or their volunteers do the maintenance for the next 10 years. So the proposal before you, you can see the designs here. The neighborhood organization is responsible for the design and installation of the garden. They are working with Metro Blooms designers and with staff. They have trained green team volunteers who will maintain this, these two gardens for the next 10 years. And after 10 years, that agreement is renewable. It includes benches, a stone path, and a variety of, of native plants. And they're hoping to do their installation starting here on May 8th. A rather interesting part of the installation is they are working with Armitage Elementary students to do some of that, as well as master gardeners and neighbors. So that's the quick uh, presentation on this. If you have any questions, I'm here, and I believe, is Tara here? We do have a representative from the neighborhood organization who works with the green team if you have any questions for them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Odell. Are there questions, comments? Um, I'll, I'll just add, I was invited to an event that was put on by this, this group in the summer, um, <laughs> and maybe it was the fall, it's all a blur, but it was re really well attended, and they had the, the exhibit where you pull the string to see how long the roots are of different plant materials, if you've ever done that before, I've done that some other place, and really did like dots on a map, different types of uh, plant materials, really some, it was really fun, and there were lots of kids around. So this is just a, a this is a neat project, and and actually, the where the uh, garden will go, there's kind of an alley that cuts through. So this will make a nice little um, buffer in case some tots start running toward the alley. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm excited to, to vote for this. So OK, with that, um, uh, all those in favor of resolution 2023-66, please say, signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone, aye. Anyone opposed? OK, that passes. And finally, we have uh, uh, one more item on our agenda. It's a, um, a study item. And Annalise is here, um, I believe, to present on uh, the North Commons Park Phase 1 improvements to give us an update. Thank you, Chairs Abeni and Alper and Commissioners. And thank you for the time tonight during the planning committee to present an update on the North Commons Park Phase 1 Improvements Project as a study report and for board discussion. The agenda of this presentation, I'll go over a brief uh, project history and status update answering why are we here and how did we get here. I'll provide a project funding update. I'm going to pose three project options for your discussion. I'm going to show you a comparison of those three options. I'm going to give you a brief community engagement update and then answer your questions and listen to your conversation. So uh, the major vision at North Commons Park started long before the park board got involved. But as the park board did get involved through the North Service Area Master Plan Project, which was approved in 2019, the northeast corner of North Commons Park was envisioned to have a new recreation center with up to four gyms in a field house a new and relocated water park, a new parking lot, and all arranged appropriately on the site. As staff initiated this project and hired the design consultant, we prepared two concepts for public review that were 100% new construction. However, a cost estimate during the design, early design phase indicated that the cost of the proposed project significantly exceeded the planned budget. And the new estimated project budget was around 49 million, while the anticipated project budget was be between 20 and 24 million dollars. Several reasons for the cost increases, including inflation, with over 22 percent cost increase in 2021 alone, as well as overall scope, uh, scope and project increases due to the engagement work we were doing and understanding of community needs. With that new cost estimate. Um, and project budget significantly misaligned. Staff and the design team created two additional concepts and that aim to deliver the same general scope of amenities, but with a reduced budget. These new concepts centered around renovating the exi existing center and building an addition. Other amenities were reduced in size and that renovation addition concept came, at, came in at around $35, $35 million overall project budget. 
Staff believed that the $35 million overall project budget was realistic due to the planned $12 million request for additional state bond funds, which you approved through your legislative agenda. We had $12 million of project funds in hand, which I'll go over in a minute. We had that bond request, and we additionally have the Parks Foundation involved in this project um, for a fundraising campaign. At this time, however, staff do not expect the Park Board to receive any additional state bond funding during this legislative cycle. So with just over $12 million committed to the project from the state, federal, and internal Park Board sources, the Park Board has been unsuccessful to date in securing additional public funds to support the project, and staff need commissioner direction to determine the scope, size, and schedule for this project. I'll go through the funding stack now. We do have our own internal capital in this project at $1.9 million. As you may or may not know, North Commons Park is ranked currently 11th out of 152 parks in the equity metrics in 2022. Out of the 1.9 million, 355,000 is specifically dedicated to a playground replacement. And there's no funding deadlines of concern with this existing funding. In 2020, the Park Board requested $11 million of state bond funds for this project, and we received $5.125 million, in large part due to community support for the project. We have a grant agreement deadline of December 31st of 2024, and in order to execute that grant agreement with the state, the Park Board has to demonstrate full project funding, meaning that all funding for the project must be secured. The note here, however, is that this, while this deadline cannot be extended by staff, it can be extended through legislative action. One limiting factor, however, is that once the project expenses begin, the Park Board has five years to complete the project. The Park Board also received $2 million as a federal community grant to be administrated through HUD in partnership with Congresswoman Omar's office, in large part due to community support for the project. Funding deadlines are not applicable to this source of funding as the grant agreement is nearly complete and the expense reimbursement deadline is in 2030. The Park Board also received $3 million of ARPA funding through the city of Minneapolis and the mayor's office, again in large part due to support from the community. The funding deadline to note here is that costs must be obligated by the end of 2024 and expended by the end of 2026. And this fund source cannot be extended. The Park Board would need to have approved expenses under contract by the end of next year. And then after entering into those contracts, we need to expend those funds before the end of 2026. But these contracts can be for design or construction. We have additional pending funding sources for this project as well. We have a current uh, $12 million bond request. As you know, North Commons Park was the number one priority in the 2023 legislative agenda. However, again, North Commons Park is not in the current bonding bill, and the Park Board does not expect to receive additional funding this year. We've applied for $5 million through Senator Smith and Klobuchar's office for a Senate appropriation and we'll know whether we've been successful or not and at what level in June or July of this year. And then there's the open question of whether or not this is, remains on the legislative agenda for next year and at what level and at your direction. The likelihood of success is unknown. We also have the Parks Foundation um, as a key partner in this project. And they've conducted a campaign feasibility study for the project in 2022, which indicated that there is strong support for the improvements outlined in the vision plan, especially if paired with increased community programming. It is likely that the campaign for private philanthropy would match the scale of public dollars committed to the project and future programming. Once a final concept is approved, the Park Foundation and the Park Board would initiate a fundraising agreement to set goals and timing and launch a fundraising campaign. The Parks Foundation has early indications and commitments of more than $10 million toward the concepts shared by the Park Board in January. It is hard to gauge funding support for something that is less than those options released. The Parks Foundation anticipates 
that it could lead a successful fundraising campaign to match the public commitments if the vision is widely supported by the community. The Parks Foundation is working to bring together community stakeholders committed to supporting the vision that will include a fundraising objective to support both capital and programming opportunities. So in summary, we have that $12 million currently in the project budget. We have deadline concerns around the state bonding, although a legislative extension is possible. And we have deadline concerns around the American Rescue Plan funding where an extension is not possible. We have $17 million of pending asks to both federal government and state. We have the open question around next year's bonding and we have the Parks Foundation involved in the project as well. So staff are proposing three basic directions or options for your conversation. We have option A where staff move forward now with a modest renovation and expansion of the existing building at a $22 million project budget. We note that this does not align with the park vision plan and likely does not meet the community's needs. Excuse me. We have option B, where we attempt to secure additional public funding for a large renovation and expansion at around $35 million. This partially aligns with the park vision plan and with community needs. Option C, we delay until additional public funding can be secured to implement a new building and a new water park around $49 million. This fully aligns with the park vision plan and with the community needs and desires. When we dig into these options, I'll note that option A is a project that's gonna build a moderate addition with space for up to two gyms, but limited additional programming space. It renovates a portion of the existing building and builds a small water park. The benefits of this option are that it fully aligns with funding deadlines and it would be completed the soonest, quarter three of 2026. The risks are that we potentially leave future public money on the table and we are delivering a project that does not fully meet the community's needs. If directed by the board to proceed, option A would move directly into preferred concept phase with board review anticipated later this year. I'll note we've provided site plans and bird's eye views of all three options. These are not intended to be preferred concepts that will be coming for you, but to represent the scale and scope of the budgets and of the projects. Digging into option B, this project builds a large addition with space for three new gyms and additional programming space. It renovates most of the existing building and builds a moderately sized water park. This project scope generally meets the North Commons Park vision plan while renovating and adding to the existing center, leveraging the existing building to create cost efficiencies while still increasing space and amenities. The risk here is that this does not align with all the funding deadlines an extension is required for state bonding and some ARPA funding would be returned or reallocated. If additional funding is not secured, the project budget and scale would equal option A, but will be delivered on the option B schedule, quarter three of 2027 completion. If directed by the board to proceed, option B would also move directly into preferred concept phase with board review later this year, followed by a delay in the detailed design with engagement in public and private fundraising continuing. This site plan shows the three new courts, the renovation of the center, the existing court, some new community spaces, and the aquatics connection to a larger water park. Again, this is not proposed as the preferred concept. Option C is guided by that $49 million project budget, which will require significant additional public dollars, most likely through state bonding and additional sources. We would build a new center with a field house large enough for four gyms and significant additional programming space, as well as a new water park. This project scope meets the North Commons Park vision plan while building all new construction. Option C does not align with funding deadlines, however, Existing ARPA funding would either be returned or reallocated. Existing state bond funding will be returned or extended if possible. 
There's a risk here that project completion is unknown and the scope is not guaranteed. If directed by the board to proceed with option C, staff would put the project on hold while the park board repositions the project to apply for public funding upwards of 30 to 35 million. Here's a site plan example of what option C could look like. The completely new location for the community center, water park, and site improvements. We start to uh, compare the schedules of each of those three options. You'll note here that in options A and B, we're proposing to move right into concept plan approval. And in option C, we have sort of an unknown schedule pending future public funding. You can also see that option A would be completed in 2026. Option B would more likely be completed in 2027. We then layer on the various funding deadlines where we have grant agreement deadlines, funding obligation or expenses under contract deadlines, as well as project expense reimbursement deadlines. Noting here that really with the state bonding and the ability to legislatively extend those deadlines, those are not the concern. It's the federal ARPA funding and having um, expenses under contract by the end of next year that are the biggest concern for the project. We've summarized the various amenities within each of those concepts and how much funding within the project budget that would be um, spent on each element. The new gym and community space being an $11 million improvement within option C and being reduced to less than $5 million in option A. I won't go through the rest of the slide but can come back to this if there's detailed questions. We've summarized the program as well, various program elements, noting here that we believe options B and C would be able to facilitate a full walking track, and option A would be limited. The various scopes of spectator seating and fitness space being reduced under option A. The inability to afford a concession space in option A while we can afford that in option B and C. The size of the community space and the gym space all of the options would include public art and pedestrian access improvements, while currently um, refrigerated ice rink is not scoped into any of these options, while it may be possible if additional public funding comes in at a significantly higher level in option C. And the water park as well is scaled down significantly in option A, while it's large or quite large in option C. We're also comparing the proposed square footages of each of these options, noting that option A is the smallest facility at about 32,000 square feet, while options B, option B is around 45,000 plus, and option C is 49,000 plus. This is a brief summary of the community engagement that we did during the concept design options phase and does not represent the engagement that was completed in advance of this January, but the open houses and virtual open houses that, were, um, that we held, as well as the various um, engagement events, we believe we engaged with over 300 individuals, um, and we compiled over 750 comments about the four concepts that were released, categorizing them into themes to understand the comment frequency. So here um, is just, a, again, a summary of that engagement. We had a significant amount of comments at requesting that refrigerated ice come into the phase one improvement scope, support for public art, support for renovating the existing community center, and concerns about the small parking lot, support for the walking track. Um, we had fairly evenly sp split comments about the concepts um, overall in terms of just general support, um, support for protecting the trees and the green space, concern about site security and support for lower, lowering the gyms into the floor to reduce the mass of the building. There are additional community engagement results and feedback that we would, staff will present to you when we bring a preferred concept forward. We also held a study report public preview at North Commons Park last night, and this is a compilation of some of the comments that staff received. So there was strong community support last night for the larger options B and C, and no vocal support for option A. Attendees expressed that a project delay is acceptable to get this generational investment right, 
and that the board should be as bold and aggressive as possible. Suggestion was made to reallocate other fund sources throughout the city to this project. Community members were interested in understanding how they could support the park board's bonding request. There were concerns about the project's decision-making process and how the study report lacks formal direction. Community members expressed concerns about the project's community engagement process, how we review this data, and how we engage with local youth. Some advocated for the refrigerated ice space to be added to this phase one project scope, and also some community members questioned whether Northsiders North needed this amenity. There were suggestions that the park board had been unsuccessful in receiving additional bonding for this project due to our lack of work with community on the project. Community members were frustrated feeling like the decision before the board tonight has already been made, and the public expressed concern that this project will be built for others outside of North Minneapolis. So in summary, bringing back those options, option A, staff would move directly into preferred concept phase with the $22 million project, keeping the project on schedule for a 2026 opening, utilizing all of the existing funding, but reducing the project scope significantly compared to the approved vision plan. Option B, we also move into preferred concept for a $35 million project. Staff will put detailed design on hold for up to one year with additional community engagement and public and private fundraising moving forward. We delay the project by one year to a 2027 opening. This requires legislative action to extend existing state funding, will compromise some amount of the existing ARPA funding keeps North Commons Park on the, par on the legislative agenda going into 2024, and does not guarantee a larger project, but could lead to a project that meets the basic goals of the approved vision plan with renovation of and addition to the existing community center. Option C, staff put the design process on hold for an unknown amount of time while additional public funding is requested. This delays the project, requires legislative action to extend the existing state funding compromises the ARPA funding, possibly the HUD funding, keeps North Commons Park on the legislative agenda, and does not guarantee a larger project, but could lead to a project that meets the goals of the approved vision plan with 100% new construction. And that concludes my presentation, and open it for questions and your conversation. Thank you, Mr. Lees. Um, does that do, are there questions? Oh, light has, uh, questions or comments, sure. Um, Comm Commissioner Thompson. I will happily pause if my colleagues um, have something they would like to ask. Um, I know this project very well, so mine is more of a comment to my colleagues. Anyone? Why don't you go, go ahead and, yes. All right, let's Commissioner Thompson, yeah. I do have a statement on North Commons as I've been intimately involved in this, and I don't know how my co colleagues have um, Questions, I think it's important that they ask. Um, you know I like to be off the cuff, but I wrote this all down because I am trying my best in a very intense situation. Um, I want to be very clear on something at the start. No matter the outcome, North Commons will be the largest neighborhood park investment in the history of NPRB. In the 140-year history of this organization, North Commons Park in the heart of North Minneapolis District 2, my district, will be the largest single investment ever. Uh, it gives me no pleasure to report when I must report next. In fact, I've felt physically ill all day. Last night, Mr. Mike Tate threatened me with physical violence. I will speak on this more in petitions and communications, but yet let it be known that far too often threats and intimidations are made in shadow and fog, thinking they'll never come to light. Will I live my life in the light? I would now like to say my thoughts on this decision. I spoke with both Senator Bobby Joe Champion and Re Representative Esther Agbaje yesterday morning to seek advice and guidance. Do they feel that we can accomplish the original intent of this project? As they are my colleagues who represent this area with me, I felt their insight valuable. Senator Champion told me directly, it is my advice that you build something with the money you already have. That is why I am stating to the board now it is my opinion that the neighborhood deserves to see us finish what we started, to make the best of our recession, to build upon what we have. Clear agencies in different spaces have lost the vision and the will around North Commons. I am not here to try to answer the question as to why. 
I simply know that it has happened. Given that truth, I struggle to balance the hard work and vision of staff and neighbors alike with the reality of what we face. I know that staff still want something grand, and I know that many neighbors do also. Yet this project increasingly shows itself to be Zeno's paradox. At each step, step is halfway there, and ultimately, we never arrive. I believe that it is the best time to move forward, and I hope that my colleagues will consider my words carefully as I am the district commissioner, neighbor, and has attended almost every single meeting I've been invited to and has sat down for conversation with anyone willing to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Are there other questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm not on this committee. Uh, I have a question for staff regarding construction costs. Um, so understanding that we will for surely lose um, $3 million of funding towards this project should we not begin construction. How much are we seeing construction costs increasing in 2023 over 2022? Is it the astronomical increases that we were seeing um, in the past few years? Are they returning back to something more moderate? Uh, do we have a feel for that at all at this time? Um, thank you, Chair Benny, Commissioner Musich, for the question. Um, first, just point of clarification, um, the $3 million ARPA funding with a one-year delay on this project would only likely compromise a portion of that as we would have contracted expenses in advance of the deadline. It's just a question of whether we'd have enough um, contracted expenses to get reimbursed for the full $3 million. So I would expect that we would lose a small portion, probably less than a third of the ARPA funding with a one-year delay and not the full $3 million. Regarding your question about construction cost increases, as we modeled this project, we've been modeling about a 7% increase year over year for the upcoming years. To, I believe be conservative. I think the climate has cooled. You'll be seeing a lot of um, bids or uh, contract award requests in the coming months from staff that have been coming in uh, within our, our budget and uh, around the cost estimates that we've been getting from our design consultants. So I believe it has cooled slightly. Okay, but it's still a pretty significant number. I mean, 7% is not nothing. Correct. And, uh, yeah. and, and our numbers have been modeling 7% year over year for the actual bid date or the bid release date that we're proposing for the options. So that's built into our assessment. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I believe we have our Parks Foundation Executive Director in the audience. If the chair would um, entertain allowing him to approach the dais, I have some questions. I think that's just fine, Thank Mr. You. Evers. Good evening, everyone. Good oh. evening. Thank Hi. you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the presentation, it noted that that you anticipated being able to bring in $10 million or more in terms of um, donations to this project. Mm -hmm. If we were to proceed with option A, which is what it seems like we have um, potentially the funding able to uh, <coughs> build with, do you anticipate any of the pledges you've received thus far of the 10 million that you, you think you have already uh, being withdrawn? It's hard to say. <coughs> um, Chairs uh, Elper and Abeni, uh, Commissioner Mesich. Um, the original conversation was for the, um, and some of those early commitments were the four concepts that were released in January. And so this option A is, is really missing a lot of the promises of the master plan. And it's disappointing to all of us. So I would say that it's, it, we can't say that that's what it is because it's a very different project. Um, and so it wouldn't be just that we would have those commitments straight out. We would have to go back to the conversations. Um, and I think it actually, frankly, will be harder to raise money in an environment which the community is, is as um, Dan had noted, there isn't any support for A from community members. That's the challenge or that's, that's we're hearing um, a lot of disappointment in that. So. From the fundraising end is, is going to be more challenging because it's out of the master plan from what we've been talking about. Okay. And would you say that option B would have a larger uh, potential for attracting additional dollars or and retaining the ones that have already been committed or 
is that also a hard sell? Um, I believe it, it's still conversations, but I, uh, in the concepts that we shared in January based on where you are, and we want to be very careful not to get ahead of the park board and decisions. That's where this is really difficult is master plans are one thing. Approved concepts are really when you make decisions, then we can lean in. So we need to, um, I would say that option A and B capture a lot of what it is. I think that there's a huge potential for, um, uh, so I just can't say right now, but I would say that when some of those conversations, A, B, and C, and D, which aren't in this plan of the original plan, January 10th, are some of the ones we talked to folks about. Okay. So, um, so what we have in front of us is not anything that people have expressed interest in investing in. We have not talked. It'd be unfair to say we haven't talked to folks about that yet. I think there is that sense of this community vision coming forward, and um, that got folks excited for the bigger visions. Okay. But I can't. I. I it's. I know we it's didn't hard test to talk those about. Out. But I'm trying to get a feel for. Yeah. How impossible. Uh, is the task that we're asking of you. Ooh, uh, because yeah. right now, like the, when I'm looking at these numbers, we have a huge delta to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and so understanding the, the appetite of the ph philanthropic community in Minnesota uh, helps, helps me to understand how, how realistic any of this is. Um, so I appreciate you, you providing us with with the information that you have available to you, which is the excitement around um, something that, that we can't yeah. afford. So thank you. If, if I can just add on in terms of this, 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 this is not a science. It's not as if we've gotten sort of like, a, it's a really challenging conversation to have. Um, I will say that the more powerful the idea and the more aligned the community is behind it, the, the more likely we are gonna have success in that fundraising. Um, a, ba a barometric a way of looking at this that we've heard in other fundraisings where we've been really successful and, and whether this is right or wrong is that um, in s the scale and size of this, a, a lot of times the major donors are asking the people I've talked to, the foundations, people who really want to come in, is matching, not matching the public dollars, but that's a good barometer. So really we believe that we could bring what the public contributes to a project. But again, that's based on what we've been talking to folks about for the past two years, which is um, more leaning towards the other two options. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Arvidsson wants to comment as well on that. Uh, Chair Benny, thank you for the um, thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to make sure to clarify for the board something that um, uh, just maybe that I heard in Commissioner Musich's comments that I want to make sure is absolutely clear. The Options B and C that we are presenting now are equivalent to the four different concepts that we presented in January. So option B is essentially the addition renovation options from January, and option C is the new construction options from January. So we've not created three completely new options. We've only created the new option A. Just wanted to make sure that was very clear as the discussion goes forward. Thank you for the time. That's all for that Thank clarification. You. I'm sorry. That's okay. Commissioner Musich. Uh, uh, Co-Chair Elper. <coughs> Thanks. I, I have, a, first of all, just a question um, for staff about this. I'm, I'm curious to hear if there's been an analysis of uh, courts and slash gyms around North Commons, if that's been factored into, if that's been part of the conversation, like where there is similar space nearby i'm just i'm just curious and then i'll <laughs> and if if it if if that exists if you could point me in the direction of where that analysis might be just as we try to make this decision or we could connect to after sure. uh, thank you co-chairs of any and helper <laughs> um we haven't done what i would call like a detailed analysis where i can go back to my desk and send you a document but we are obviously aware of the gyms at north high at the YMCA and, and the ones that are under construction at V3 up the road as well. Um, we sort of note that our gyms would be different as we would have control and ability to have community events, park board activities, and tournaments within our own space that um, we can't necessarily guarantee at other spaces. Um, but we also acknowledge that there are there is additional gym space in North that would allow us to partner with those organizations to um, host events that may need more gyms than we may be able to have on our property. Thanks for that. Um, I, I would like to speak to the, the, the 
the question of refrigerated ice rinks, I think uh, I just have a, a thought on that and I'm curious to follow up later, um, but to bring it forward tonight. You know, this winter, um, it was not a long winter. I mean, it was a long winter, but it was a terrible winter for ice. Terrible winter, and I just did a quick look. You know, we had 23 rinks with the 2022-2023 season, and, and honestly, we can just call it the 2023 season because 2022 didn't even exist for natural ice. So because we had a you know spike in temperature, it ruined everything. We had to go back to the drawing board. Even staff did um, restart the ice making process. So I just I just think it's in our best interest to think about how long is natural ice for our climate. And I would like to you know this is what made me think of it. But I think um, as we as we think about the future of ice rinks. What's, what's our long range plan? Because I see us putting in lots of effort and lots of time, which equals dollars, frankly, and, but a decreasing our ROI, return on investment for what we're getting in terms of time. Is there gonna be a year in the future when we have two weeks of good natural ice? I, I think it could be. So I would like to start thinking about the plan now for where we want to go. And I, I would personally, as a, as a dedicated ice skater but not hockey player, I would rather have consistent, reliable ice that lasts longer, that is maybe, I, I'd be really sad about this, not available at my local park, but I know I can go there and I can ice skate. Um, versus what we had this past winter. So I, you know, could, could it be a plan where we have one ice skating rink per quadrant of the city? And could North Park be, North Commons be that spot? That, that's what I bring forward to you tonight to keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna call on Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, Co-Chair Elper. I just wanna speak toward the, or Co-Chair Benny, this is the second time I've done that to you. Sorry, Co-Chair Elper. Sorry, Co-Chair Benny. You guys and your names. Okay. Whew. I want to speak toward last night was not how I would like to conduct any sort of community meeting or gather data from that. I, this morning, received many emails in support of option A. Why? Because of the fact that people did not feel comfortable voicing, I got shouted down last night. I, the district commissioner, was told to sit down and shut up. And a lot of people in this room witnessed that. Um, and when, when, when I am shouted down, community members just peep down. And so I have emails from residents saying, we like option A. So to say that there's no support for that is erroneous. It says it's not true. Um, I, I recognize the desire, all the desires. I am trying to be pragmatic in my approach. Option B would be great. They're all, I've, I've talked with staff about finding some amalgam of them. It really has to do with, do we say go now or do we risk losing the project completely? That is what we are faced with and I wanna be clear on that with staff and community. Thank you. Commissioner Menz. Thank you, I'm not on this committee, but I um, appreciate you letting me speak. So last night's meeting was a, a difficult community engagement option. Um, and, but it was also impassioned. And there, and there was, there is response around community. My, my question is regards to how do we commit this was designed to be a generational impact in North Minneapolis, and maybe it still will be. And you know, the, the Commissioner Thompson has explained that this will be the largest investment, and I'm assuming that with the 22 million, it would still be the largest investment in a community park, which that, that's amazing. I mean, so, so we're already starting from a, from a good place there. But generational impact and how we can impact the children and the families 
and the people who go to parks. And I and I echo um, Commissioner Alper, like the refrigerator dice is, and that is a powerful part of North Commons Park. That's a powerful part of my history with North Commons Park, which might be important, might not be. My son started playing there, but there's also a boy named Chevelle Hickman who started playing hockey at North Commons Park. And it, it's important for folks to understand that piece too. But what I'm concerned about is that we sold Congressman Omar, um, the state before on the $11 million or the $5 million we got, we sold these entities on this generational concept. And I wonder, like, what is our integrity in going forward with, with a plan that is bold? And I'm not saying that option A is not bold, but I don't know if it's enough. And I know that anything that happens at North Commons Park is going to directly benefit my district. That it is an 18 minute bike ride from Northeast Park and it is a 16 minute bike ride to Waite Park. So it is not that far. We are connected. And North Commons Park can have a huge impact in the community. And I think that the, the represent, like champion and uh, representative Esther is really important to understand. But what I like to tell my kids, baseball games are long. And when you start a baseball game and you get down five to nothing, you don't give up. And I wonder, our first priority was North Commons Park. Why did we give up? The session is not over. Why are we not asking for more money? I don't understand. The session is still going. The state has billions of dollars. And we're like, oh, well, that's not OK. I guess, I guess we're not going to fund that this year. We have three weeks. The community has done. I, I just don't understand why we're stopping. Well, we're down 5 nothing. We're done. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Menz. Uh, uh, President Forney. Thank you. I'm not on this committee either. Excuse me, no, I'm not on the A team. That's what it is. It's the <laughs> Benny Alpert A team. Anyway, um, um, I guess first of all, I should say I get excited about all the plans, okay? Because uh, it is. It's a huge, huge, huge investment, no matter which one you look at. Um, but I am, um, I don't know what word, I feel like I'm not being fiscally uh, responsible, maybe that's the way to say it, to leave money on the table. Um, that is Commissioner Men's, you know, we sold the idea to, you know, some people who believed in us. So um, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how, how can we have it all um, is really what it comes down to. Um, I know we, um, I know how long our citizen engagement, how long our design process takes. And I'm wondering if we can, how should I say, phase this in, fingers crossed, legs crossed, but I, I, I feel as if it's not just a hope, a dream, whatever, um, that if we start it now, can we miss, as the graph shows, you know, that, that point where um, we would potentially lose some of those dollars. Um, in other words, get things in the queue um, so that we can uh, maximize, well, at least B, I guess I, I would say. Um, and I'm not sure that, you know, uh, a C is, is ever possible, but um, I am an optimist. <laughs> but uh, I just feel like, is there a way that we can uh, begin start the process instead of waiting um as i think you are explaining dan um to begin b um if we can start some of that now so that we can be, be better assured that we're not going to lose some of that funding that's already um committed to us so that's my first question do you think that's anything possible to think about thank you co-chair zabeni and alper president forney um, if the board is open to a different type of preferred concept approval, one in which we bring you varying preferred concepts depending on the project budget and, uh, 
and finding a way to sort of approve a scalable project, it becomes easy to scale A from A to B if additional public funding and then private funding comes in. So that's a very easy task to design, at least from a preferred concept perspective. I think from a detailed design perspective, we don't want to really start putting pen to paper until we really know what the project budget's going to be. But from a preferred concept perspective, we could scale A and B as a, as a concept to have you guys review that and give us direction. We could, in theory, also simultaneously propose a preferred concept C in case we are successful with the, in this bonding cycle or the next. There will come a point, probably likely very early next year, in which we would need to come to you for very clear direction relating to what the funding realities of the project are. And again, sort of hinting to you what those funding deadlines would be and what money would be potentially lost if we move forward with a specific direction. So um, it wouldn't be a typical preferred concept approval. Um, it would be one that would be sort of scalable. It's one that I've been thinking about, but that would be at your direction. Thank you. Thank you for your candor. And I, I guess, you know, I, I That's the direction I would like to go. That's the direction I would like to, you know, have um, uh, us approve. Um, it's unique, um, but I feel that it's something that I, I, I feel that there's a strong enough vision um, and, and hope, you know, whatever. I'm putting an awful lot on the foundation, but uh, you guys have been pretty awesome. Um, but I, I feel like Closing the doors at this point in time, I couldn't support. So, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer. I don't have a lot of um, comments here other than I just was really encouraged to hear that staff um, are persevering on this and not giving up, and that you're also dialoguing with the other nonprofits in the area and what's coming down the road with V3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because I think sometimes our nonprofits and public agencies can get in our silo and begin to compete against one another. And, you know, that's sad because we're all on the same team and we all want the best facilities. And so, um, you know, maybe there's been a little hype around other things since our project started. But I, I don't think we should give up on it. Um, but at the same time, really be strategic in how we use our funds. So we don't end up, we've got, we've got the right mix for the community, right? Um, because we want everybody going everywhere, right? We want the triathletes and the bikers and the, you know what I mean? We, we, want, we want to maximize for the youth what we've got and that takes our very best effort that takes as much money as we can find and it takes going to take a lot of wisdom and give and take from all sides because it's not an easy answer we don't want to lose money we don't want to cut back on the dream so um, i just want to tell you thank you for your work and um let's stay positive I i'm encouraged and i want i want the funders to stay positive you know because uh we got a lot of options here this is, this is a good problem to have. <laughs> I like it. Commissioner Menz. Thank you. Um, that was really positive. That was a really great way to frame that. Commissioner Schaefer, um, I would like to say that I was at the community meeting last night. And I would also like to reiterate that I was upset um, at the treatment of Commissioner Thompson at the meeting. But I, and, I, and, and that is something that needs to be rectified. It's very hard to go to these meetings and not engage. It's extremely difficult. As you sit in these meetings and there's almost like a clamoring for, for clarification from the commissioners and Dan and Adam are standing up there and they are presenting this material and we are like behind some veil of we're not able to speak. And I, and I find it very difficult to, to engage the community that way. I find it very difficult and siloing to engage a community in rows of chairs and then force people. Like, it, it just doesn't feel engaging sometimes. So I would come, I would like us to explore that. 
because Dan and Adam did a great job of presenting the options that we have to the community. It was a very difficult presentation and I commend them and how they did that, but we set them up for failure. We set all of ourselves up for failure because what we should have done is pick up the chairs and put it in a circle and everybody look each other in the eye. And Mr. Tate did go to the front of the room because he wanted to address everyone. And everyone should get that opportunity in this community engagement process. We are addressing everyone. We are a group. We are a community. Communities of color, indigenous communities, circles are important. And we should give that opportunity to people. And I would implore us to do that because we will get more positive comments like Commissioner Schaefer and we will really see each other instead of looking at the back of somebody's head who is communicating an important topic. And I would also say that Mr. Tate did not go to the front of the room until everybody else had, there was a lull and a silence <coughs> in the room. There was gonna be less engagement. It was going to be over. So, although I think Mr. Tate does owe Commissioner Thompson an apology, I do think we need to work on how we engage our communities deeply. Okay. Um, I think we've been around and people that had uh, any input have put their lights on and um, I guess, you know, this is in very informative. I'm, you know, I. <laughs> hearing all, you know, the commissioner of the district, all, you know, lots of perspective. I think some of what uh, um, President Forney said is is a is a good idea. Um, my fear is also, you know, the the moonshot and then, you know, that's what we really worry about with C, honestly. But B seems like it could be attainable, and if there's the scalable approach. Um, and you can start some design. There's some s enough similarities, I think, between A and B, if I understand them well enough, that you know they're not you're not scraping the site for either of those, you know, the water park and so on. So you wouldn't be you could head in a design direction or um, you know some work, getting some work done that might kind of work well for both of those concepts. And then I really appreciate well a lot of the passion here and also. Um, uh, Commissioner Schaefer's rah-rah that I think this is, we're getting this money, this is gonna happen. This is really positive. So I'm thinking that, I think that, I think that, you know, being a little safe, but going for a little more is, is a, good, a good strategy. So with that, um, that was the last item, so I'll adjourn the planning committee. Operations? I'm up. Uh, the time being 8.07 p.m. I will call the Operations and Environment Committee to order. Secretary Ringgold, can you please take the roll? Commissioner Schaefer. Here. Commissioner Alper. Here. Commissioner Abeni. Here. Vice Chair Menz. Here. Chair Musage. Present. You have a quorum. Wonderful, thank you. Um, could I please get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Uh, we also have some minutes this evening. Would someone like to move them? I will move those minutes. The minutes of December 7th, 2022. 2022. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion carries. We have an agenda. We have adopted minutes. We now are ready to begin our study report section of the agenda, um, which we are going to expand in scope slightly to include uh, information about the updated integrated pest management policy, uh, which we opened the comment period on this evening during our consent agenda. Um, thus, short-circuiting the ability to give the presentation, and I would hate to not get a presentation that someone put together to inform us on. Uh, especially since I anticipate we will get some questions from the public about the updated policy, um, and I would love for us to be informed when discussing that with them. So, uh, take it away, Assistant Superintendent Barrick. All right, uh, good, thank you, Chair Musich, and good evening, Commissioners. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was kind of everything I was gonna say, so thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna Sorry about that. Actually, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, so couple trying to kind of you know uh, be efficient here in the evening with um, the integrated pest management policy. 
um, was something that this board adopted in 1998, and it was last revised in 2008. And so um, through the past few years, we've been working to update that policy. We are opening and we're following the community engagement process. So over the past few months, you've seen some community engagement plan PNCs, and I'll ask um, our supervisor, our horticulture supervisor, Kate Ryan, to quick do a, a, a brief overview of the, the policy, and then we will switch gears to, uh, you'll recall, maybe a couple of months ago, a month ago, uh, there was another petitions and communications on uh, every year we do a, uh, a pesticides report to the board, and so we'll switch gears and share then the uh, 2022 uh, IPM report which gives you an update and an overview. And so, uh, but before I turn over, I do want to give a shout out to, to Kate and her team. Um, Kate has done an incredible job of working across the organization with everyone around our IPM and our pesticides. And so our horticulture work group uh, within the asset management department is, uh, is really growing and uh, doing remarkable things. And so I will turn it over to Kate. Welcome, Kate. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, we'll kind of get started. Our, as Jeremy said, our last um, <coughs> IPM policy, it, Integrated Pest Management, was updated in 2008. We know that this no longer reflects our current operations or our standards of care of all the varieties of landscapes you're going to find within our urban park system. Um, we had a resolution pushed forward by Commissioner Musich. Um, 2021-213, which directed staff um, to revise this policy um, in, in accordance with the community engagement policy. So the four main updates you're gonna see in this proposed draft is you're gonna see the function of the document shift from policy to a policy plus an operations manual. You're gonna see some adjusted thresholds to uh, reflect the current operations. And then you're gonna see a lot of additional park areas that were not previously included in our IPM policy. And those uh, park areas will represent a lot of work groups that were not previously represented in our IPM policy. So we'll start with the function of the document. The function of the document provides the core of IPM policy information, including thresholds. It'll add operational insight into kind of the decision-making processes and considerations that staff makes. Um, to work within an IPM policy and management plan. And then it also adds some context of legal requirements um, in other governing organizations. Updated thresholds, here's a few examples of some updated thresholds. We, when we look at golf, you can see some current thresholds from 08 and then some updated ones uh, in this proposal for 2023. Um, you're going to see some updates where we maybe had a blanket number, but now we're going to break it down a little bit more about, you know, instead of having the greens have a threshold of zero to 2%, what does that differ between fungus and insect damage and then plants being, you know, weeds? Same with athletic fields, looking at what are the different needs between an infield and an outfield could be something that we'd want to consider <coughs> looking at. Hard surfaces were never considered in the 08 uh, last revision, but we wanna make sure we include those because those are important to your athletic field experience. And then all of our gardens, formal landscapes and turf, um, we have a lot of different features that have a lot of different um, user expectations um, and purposes. So we wanna make sure we break those down. We also have a ton of new types of turf in our system before we maybe had one kind of general turf. Now we have bee lawns, we've reduced mow areas, no mow lawns, um, in addition to kind of your traditional Kentucky bluegrass formal turf. So we wanna make sure that those are represented as well. And then additional park landscape features, dog parks, community orchards, community gardens are managed in um, natural areas shorelines, wetlands, vegetative stormwater facilities, vacant lands or new park construction, all of these are now included in the proposed uh, update. And then additional work groups that maybe were not in the 08, forestry was unrepresented in the 08 revision, water quality, our new community garden program is now in there, natural resources, and then obviously planning, 
um, in all of the new park constructions and remodels and land acquisitions. Um, the new proposal um, includes some no pesticide zones um, and some language around those. And then there's gonna be additional resource documents. The proposed policy update includes links to exterior documents or organizations that may influence, direct, or impact our IPM policy and how it is implemented in the care of our parkland. So thinking about city of Minneapolis ordinances, also Minnesota state laws, whether it be Department of Ag or Department of Natural Resources, and then University of Minnesota. They have a lot of research that really impacts how we take care of our parks. And then we also know that there needs to be a frequency of review established. Obviously, last updated in 2008, that's a long time to go without a revision, and that's why it no longer reflects our current operations. So an integrated pest management policy really functions as a working document for land care professionals. It's constantly changing and evolving. We have new research. There's new products that become available. Uh, pest pressure, maybe it's a new introduced pest. Maybe it's a change in climate or weather conditions season to season, um, but they make it so that this has to be flexible, it has to evolve and we have to shift. Um, so it's necessary to review this and update and have a process for that. So recommending that obviously it's reviewed annually, but making sure we really do an update cycle of maybe three to five years. And then kind of in community engagement plan, obviously tonight we'll open the 45 day comment period um, from there, we hope to do some staff revisions and then move forward by the <coughs> late summer to get the board approved policy in place. And that is all I have on that. If you guys have any questions. Fantastic. Uh, just to help my colleagues, thresholds in the slides that you showed us previously, those are the threshold at which we would intervene to address what is present in the system. Um, just for anyone who hasn't bathed in the waters of integrated pest management policy making. Um, I don't, I, yeah, it's, I'm getting a little punch drunk right now because uh, I've been up for a super long time. But so a threshold, like when we go out into the, when our staff go out, goes out into the system and they're managing a space, they need to determine what their trigger is to do something about it, be that a physical intervention or a chemical intervention or some other intervention to address what they're seeing in the system. And that threshold is what is what is being defined in this document. So now I'm happy to entertain questions and I wasn't paying attention to lights. Um, I think, okay, so Commissioner Benny is going to be assertive and declare she was first. Uh, Commissioner Benny, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I think it's very, very important to get the, the policy out there. And um, I, I, you know, I'm going to make the same comment I kind of made about the other policy. You know, there, you know, this is there's a lot of subject matter expertise that goes into developing. You know, an integrated you know pest management plan, but policy. And I get really uncomfortable when we put technical decisions in front in, 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 in front of public engagement. Um, I think that's probably how in the in the report that because I read it a few days ago, but we ended up with a, maybe a wildly aggressive organics test. I'm not totally sure what happened in the past. That was because of public pressure. And so, you know, I want I my, I would support um, a really um, strong technical. I mean. Um, technically based policy and and the park board the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board is has got to be in the top five organizations in in the state I would think in terms of um, expertise in this area so I just don't want to put all of these things to the public let's let's have a kind of a core set of of real technical um, sort of pinned in points that'd be my preference I don't even know what I'm talking about I'm as punchy as Commissioner <laughs> Musich thank you <laughs> Uh, thank you for those comments. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know uh, what staff will do with that, but uh, I believe at this point, the document we have is heavily reliant upon technical expertise. Okay. So um, I would hope that as part of our community engagement, we are receiving feedback from the public about, does this make sense? Are there areas where you would we'd appreciate more communication? Um, around how we're doing this work, things like that. That's what I'm, I'm hoping we're gonna see from the public because I, I feel like people want to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. 
Um, and so how, 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 like how do you see improvements to this uh, document that'll help you get that information? Um, so anywho, uh, I believe next we have Commissioner Schaefer. Yes, and I think um, we'll see it similar to probably what we saw in the land use policy around you know those 85 comments or whatever that we'll then, I would think, learn, learn from or see. My question was, um, has there been implementation you know issues from staff around this document and have you collected feedback from staff the the people on the ground as far as how this has changed their workflow and if there are some tweaks that they would like to see maybe not quite so organic or what you know what I mean on this spectrum um, I, I hope that is that represented in this plan currently uh, chair Musich uh, Commissioner Schaefer yes so the current update went from an eight page document to a 58 page document because of staff input. Okay. Um, because IPM touches so many work groups, each work group developed and gave the feedback on their section um, to put together this draft. And then we had a, a technical writer help us draft it. Thank you. The other piece that I'll just throw out there, I'm not, um, I haven't had experience with it, but I have heard from several of the Buckthorn busters, whatever you want to call them, that they wish there were some treatment for very specific on the top of the trunk that would make their, you know, a little painting on top. I don't, I don't even know what it's called. But um, I hope that that's some of the feedback that we hear from the community and um, can wrestle with because I do think if there are processes that are controlled and have parameters and boundaries, that it could um, help not only staff, but some of the, you know, volunteers that are guided by staff. Thank you uh, for those comments. I believe next we have Commissioner Alper. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for this presentation. I uh, had a, I just had a clarifying question, Commissioner Musich. Yeah. Um, so could you just walk me through one of these examples? Oh, you bet. Is it? I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, or Kate could do it. Because yeah. She is the expert. I'm just a highly knowledgeable <laughs> generalist on this topic. You know, a little bit about a lot. Yes. I have a like about a the <laughs> inch deep, 12 mile wide view on this kind of stuff. So I will let Kate uh, explain this. Okay, like, so could, we, could we pick one, like, let's say fairways? <laughs> Are you referring to thresholds specifically? Yes, yeah. Okay. So with with thresholds, let's do something that people really love, Japanese beetles. That's, I'm We're more. <laughs> so love. Japanese beetles um, <laughs> are, you know, if we see one Japanese beetle in the rose garden, it's munching on a rose, it, it's causing damage. We, we're going to just move and say, great, we saw it today. If there's 20,000 Japanese beetles covering X percentage of our rose garden, it's going to trigger action. So we look at percentages for thresholds as a measurable way to do it. So that way it's not based on opinion or I, you know, I really want that to be a pristine rose bed. So if we look at, we have 62 interior rose beds. Oh, if we could have, could you go to the rose bed one then? And if, yes. Instead. Thanks. So for formal gardens, um, you can see that we would have a 0% tolerance, which is more about uh, like herbaceous weeds. But if you look at perennial and shrub beds for like a rose garden, we have a threshold proposed of 20% insect damage. So okay. if, oh, may I stop you? I just, yes. if, just to make sure I'm getting it. So it's not as, it's not we tolerate 0% in the formal garden beds. It's. We, yeah, we tolerate, we would tolerate nothing as far as like weed pressure. We would hand weed. Doesn't mean that we would act to chemical. It would mean we would take some sort of action. So in the example of Japanese beetles, if less than 20% of our garden was affected by them, we would probably not take any action. Once we hit that 20% threshold, that is time where it triggers us to take more aggressive actions. We might have preventative measures in there that are under the 20%, but we would not take aggressive measures until we hit that 20% threshold for 
affected area. Makes sense. Thank you. I, I think I'll follow up with you. Okay. <laughs> um, great. And uh, I, I thank you very much for going through that, and I'll, I'll read it in depth and um, follow up. Um, I, I just, I, I think I'd like to get back to Commissioner Aveni's thought about, like, what is a public policy? And just, you even said it, like, now that it's 58 pages, and and, and that uh, somewhere in these slides it said it was the operations manor, manual too, and it's like, do, do we need to approve the, should we be approving the operations manual? I mean, you know, we don't approve the HR manual, at least I don't think we do. You know, so this is, it's not really a question for, for you, I, I think maybe for Assistant Superintendent <laughs> Barrick, but I, I think it's a question I have about the level of depth you know, I'm definitely not a technical expert in pesticide management. Yep. And I'd, I'd rather set the broad strokes and then have the experts weigh in on the details. I, I, I think. I mean, maybe, maybe I want to weigh in. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Since Superintendent Barrick, did you want to respond to that? Thank you, Chair Musich and Commissioner Alper. Um, it was, um, so a lot of this was informed going back to the um, Pesticide Advisory Committee um, and the work that was done there, where we heard, you know, we engaged the public for a two year period of time around our pesticide use. And so when we, you know, went to go and revise the IPM policy, we thought there was a benefit to including the operations manual for transparency. So to let the public know that while we have these thresholds, and in some of these examples, we, we go that we, there was a couple that mentioned like, if you look at the natural lakes and ponds, right? So we're reducing the, or we're changing the threshold from 100% to 80%, but restrict chemical control. So it doesn't necessarily mean that once you hit that threshold, you're gonna use chemicals or, or pesticides, but it means we're gonna intervene and then the, the manual kind of lays out when and where we would be using mechanical versus in, in going down the line to a pesticide, which can be an insecticide, a fungicide, an herbicide, right? When do we go to those? And then when we're selecting those, saying how we would choose the least toxic, most target specific. So it was in an effort of transparency. I appreciate the support. And it's, we would love to hear that, yes, the experts, and we do have a fantastic team um, working on this with a lot of experience. Um, and I think you'll see some of that in the next presentation when we go through the, when Kate goes through the annual report. You'll see how far we've come in the, in the past three, four years. So I hope that So helps. to clarify, we are asking for feedback on the policy, not on our operations manual. The operations manual is available to provide insight into how we apply the IPM policy to the way we do work. I would say even if someone has, you know, comments on the methods or you know, so you're open to that. We're open to that, right? Okay. Like we, I mean, we we plan. You know, we will share this. This will be. We will send this out to the pesticide advisory committee from the past for their, you know, open comment review. It is. It is a. It's a public policy, but you'll it, you'll see that this is kind of an inform. This isn't the full engage, and this is a little outside of my wheelhouse, right? This is a planning. <laughs> we're trying to be planners here. Yeah. Um, but we're trying. You know, following the land use policy like where we crafted it, we took comments, we'll consider those comments, we'll make adjustments, we'll put the policy forward for board approval, and then we'll follow it. Right? Great, thank okay. you. You have a follow-up question? Yeah, I just have one follow-up. I guess what I'm trying to get at here with the idea of the manual, or that, the idea of the details, that um, if I got the year right, it was 2008, like you should, I, I want staff to feel liberated to next year revise the manual without taking it back to the board or like that that is anyway so that's the piece that i feel is trepidatious the right word i don't know i think that's yeah. what we was our hesitation on the the land policy some of it at least so that's anyway so, so there's a need in your mind for more flexibility for staff to do their jobs yes, um beyond yeah. beyond the policy without yeah. us having to approve it. So yes. if they see a way that's going to improve the process and reduce pesticide use, et cetera, uh, they would be able to do that without having to come to us and say, hey, I want to update the policy to make that happen. I, I, would, 
I would say that that the um, whatever policy that we set forth would give them that flexibility to update the practice or the procedures that that um, yeah, yeah not so the policy not should be should empower staff to improve process yes okay so that is some great feedback I agree with that as well you have three commissioners at least now uh, saying to you in your public comments <laughs> These are very public and on YouTube forever and ever and ever until YouTube dies and all its servers burn up um, when the sun explodes, probably. Uh, yeah, so if you could think of ways that you could incorporate that flexibility um, into the policy as written, that'd be great. Uh, Commissioner Mens, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for the report. I also, I would like to connect maybe um, to the facility study committee. Like I think that this might be interesting to looking at the ball diamonds that is happening because I have heard, I wanted to share this comment, like I'm not sure what the threshold is for use on like warning tracks, which from what I've heard is a really big maintenance issue, but not really a necessary part of the ball field. Like maybe maybe there's some advisement around eliminating warning tracks because it would save us money and pesticide use. So I would really like to connect both those departments around like how would that sort of impact some of the facility studies we do, which might have impact on pesticide use. Because I know that that, that that's a question that's raised a lot and I talk to people about ball fields and everybody's like, oh, it's not a perfect ball field or it's not perfectly manicured. and I, and I want us to be educators around, we're not using pesticides for every damn weed that we see on this field. That's not what the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board does. It's not what we should do. So uh, somehow figuring out how we provide, own that process and say, this is what we do and be proud of it and be like, our ball fields are not gonna look like maple groves. And there's a reason for that and it's a, reason that's based in integrity and expertise that that we should own and be proud of. And I, I just think that if we can sort of bridge that gap, that'd be awesome. Thank you, Commissioner Menz. Okay, looks like, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Abeni. Abeni. Yes. It's all you sorry. for a second time. Sorry, sir. thank you. I mean, I just one more degree that uh, what Commissioner Men said just sort of made me think about this a little bit of a degree of difficulty. But since it's a policy, just throwing it out there, if we are, when we're doing um, projects and we're developing new areas, and it's the kind of area that may sort of step into being part of the, you know, integrated pest management approach because of what we've put there, a formal garden, which I don't think we do that often, but you get what I'm saying. Um, maybe it's also valuable uh, when we do that to look, because we're only one of the main issues is, there's a habitat issue, there's issues with the food web and all that, I think, but <clears throat> also runoff, right? So maybe there's a way to actually um, partner, put in a BMP, you know, think about ways that we could also um, mitigate through, um, you know, stormwater practices, at least that aspect of it. So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, that p kind of plan for the future operation of an IPM location as we're develop redeveloping the park system. Okay. So that was a suggestion for planning? Maybe. Okay, planners, that was for you. <laughs> if you missed it, uh, like I said, this is on YouTube till the sun explodes. Um, <laughs> Next presentation. I think you're still presenting to us, right, Kate? And I know people are confused now, but I'm just gonna re refresh our memories. Um, this, the presentation we just saw was the one we should have seen in, um, in consent. And now we're into the one that's actually on our agenda, which is uh, the annual summary of pesticide use, et cetera. You got it. So um, we do an annual integrated pest management report. So the data you're gonna see presented in this report is going to reflect the previous calendar year for 2022. So to get started, what is integrated pest man management? Um, integrated pest management is usually abbreviated IPM. That's the term you'll hear us me use mostly, but it's an 
effective and environmentally sensitive approach to pest management that relies on a common combination of common sense practices. IPM programs use current comprehensive information on life cycles of pests and their interactions with the environment. This information in combination with available pest control methods is used to manage pest damage by the most economical means and with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. And so how does IPM work? So we talked a little bit in the previous one about thresholds. So <laughs> kind of the very simplistic version of it is we're gonna set an action threshold. We're gonna monitor and identify pests, which is super important. We need to be looking for them and we need to be able to identify them correctly. Uh, once we do that, we're able to determine prevention strategies, um, which is really important because we don't wanna have to intervene. But if we hit, you know, we exceed an action threshold, then we're gonna do some sort of control measure. Control measures can be a variety of things. They can be cultural practices. We aerate our ball fields to improve our soil conditions so that we have less knotweed. Um, mechanical, this could be hand pulling weeds, this could be volunteers pulling buckthorn. Um, biological, we have um, biological controls. Um, there's a fly that feeds on Japanese beetles. We love to encourage them to be in our rose garden to help us control our Japanese beetle population. There are biocontrols for other um, noxious weeds. Um, typically you'll see insects that eat a specific type of weed we are trying to reduce the population of. And then lastly, we would fall into chemical and that can include both synthetic pesticides or organic pesticides. So what is a pesticide? According to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, it's gonna be any substance or mixture of substances that it's intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating. Um, it could be a plant regulator, defoliant, or desiccant, and then anything that's gonna be used to stabilize nitrogen. So there are um, a couple relevant Minnesota state governing agencies that will impact our IPM, and that would be the Minnesota Noxious Weed Law that's managed by the Department of Ag. Um, these plants are going to have some legal control, um, legal controls defined in this law. So some plants are noxious because they harm people, animals, or the food we eat, or the natural environment. Um, the Minnesota Department of Ag, uh, county, city, and township officials are inspecting land, and we ask owners to control, eradicate and eradicate noxious weeds that are present in order to keep them from spreading and harboring, harming neighboring lands. Um, great examples, emerald ash borer falls into, into that kind of idea of, of an, uh, a noxious weed. But then we go into the, Minis the Minnesota DNR invasive species management, and that will have a list of invasive plants, but it will also include animals um, insects or other things like that. So both of these organizations are at the state level and kind of have their own separate lists depending on their area of focus. And then we have internal kind of policy ordinances and direction. We had our moratorium in 2018 that ended the use of pesticide products containing glyphosate on parklands. And then we had the resolution in 2021 that gave us some direction forward, including um, the policy update. So reporting and record keeping, um, the annual IPM report is compiled at the close of the calendar year with the comprehensive records that become available. Records are captured in our asset management software, which is currently ViewWorks, and we are required by law to maintain application records for five years after an application. Um, having a central cloud-based storage location has helped us improve our record keeping protocols um, over the last two to three years. Um, kind of a system-wide snapshot so you guys get a kind of a good overview on where we are using pesticides. Pesticides, remember, are going to be both organic and synthetic. They're all going to be captured um, in this report. So you're going to see our primary use of pesticides is going to be at our um, athletic complexes, whether that be golf courses or athletic fields. But then we also have amounts in other areas um, within the park system. So I'll kind of break down each section. So general parkland, this is just a catch-all term that's like everything that doesn't fall into anything else. So neighborhood parks, large sections of our regional parks. And 
Um, due to the high percentage of turf grass in these areas, mechanical control is our primary way of controlling pests in this area. If you mow your grass, you don't have weed seeds, you can control them from spreading. Um, you can control woody plants growing in our, you know, herbaceous hillside plantings or naturalized areas. So we did no applications of pesticides on general park land in 2022 as a result of that. Horticulture, um, this is going to capture all of our formal landscapes, whether it be formal gardens, native plant gardens, shrub beds, formal lawns. We have a variety of sites all around the city. Um, some of them would include the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden or Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden, um, Loring Park, Waterworks, all of those we consider kind of formal landscape sites. So in accordance with the resolution 2021-213, staff continued to seek out organic options to trial and management strategies that would allow us to reduce our inputs. Um, organic product applications are included in the total pesticide volume. So you can see year over year between 2019 and 2022, we had a huge spike in pesticide applications. Um, that is gonna be primarily due to organic inclusions. We know that reducing pesticide use and implementing more organic strategies are kind of mutually exclusive um, because organics are usually applied in a higher volume um, at a more frequent rate. Um, primarily, we are using herbicide um, for 2022 in our horticulture areas. So we did favorably have our organic herbicide treatments in 2022, wherever feasible. Um, staff determined that while more organic products continue to enter the market, we have not identified a product yet that works well in our program. Um, the vast majority of our applications were organic in 2022 um, as staff tried out and sought different products. Uh, one pro one uh, trial was Canada thistle. It's on the noxious weed list and it's a very challenging one for us to control. Um, you can see the bed, uh, the image on the far left is going to be our lilac shrub collection bed in the Lindell Park Arboretum um, in early summer. Um, after one organic trial, that center photo shows significant burn back of that thistle. Um, it quickly rebounded and looked about the same two weeks later. Um, and so we went to a different strategy after about four organic treatments um, to see what else we could try that was non-chemical um, but would give us more long-term control. And our team found a product called uh, weed suppressant matting. It's a wood mat comprised of recycled wood from northern Minnesota. It's made in floodwater, Minnesota. Um, it kind of works like people might think of like a landscape fabric. Um, we obviously discourage landscape fabric due to plastics being in the environment, but this is biodegradable. Um, the vendor said they would guess about three to five years and this would totally break down in the park. So we said, let's try it. And we currently have it at five park sites. Um, there's a trial at CPRO. Uh, Whittier, Painter, the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden, Lindale Park, and then we're adding more sites. We are entering the third season at our first site, so we still don't know the breakdown over the three to five years. Um, but so far it's showing really great control. That thistle, um, you can see that's after they put down that weed suppressing matting. Can you go back? Can you go back to the previous slide? Oh, yes. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, after we put down the weed suppressant matting, um, it remains looking like that um, through the rest of the season, and we hope it's still looking like that this spring. Um, we're continuing to monitor it to see if the thistle can make it through it, which it might. So we also need to talk about um, IPM isn't static. Um, Inputs are not static. We can't expect that if we're trending away that we're going to always trend that way. So environmental conditions heavily impact disease and pest pressures. The best example is the Lindell Park Rose Garden. On the left, you're going to see kind of a pesticide use um, by year. And then that blue line is going to show you the average rainfall for that growing season. You can see it. We had a very wet um, year in 2019, followed by a significant drop off into a drought. And if you look at that graph on your right, it's going to take away the organics and just show you the synthetics, which are going to be a better comparison for you to look at how weather impacts our pesticide use. 2019 was really wet. We used a significant amount more um, 
fungicide at the rose garden to control black spot and other fungal diseases because of that wet weather. We used nothing for the last two years, for 2021 and 2022, because we were in a drought and the pressure did not exceed the threshold that we would take chemical action. The staff also does a lot of cultural practices to reduce that. We have certain water windows and they watch the weather because if a rose plant leaves stay wet for uh, longer than a certain length of time, then we introduce fungal pressure. So we also are very intentional. So if you go to the rose garden, you're like, why are they watering right now? It's because we are giving the plant enough time to dry before temperatures drop to a certain amount so that we can reduce fungal pressure. We also have some partnerships in research. Um, Dr. Vera Krishnik at the University of Minnesota um, has a lab conducting research on Japanese beetle management with native soil inhibiting pathogen. Um, she's trying to locate where this fungus is present. So she is, uh, with our permission, is using some park board sites to kind of conduct this research and hopefully we'll be able to, you know, that research will help us better control our Japanese beetle populations in the city. Um, it's in Michigan, um, they've been doing work for this for a while, about 10 years. Um, and six years post inoculation, the Japanese beetle grubs numbers have dropped 30% for them. So wow. it's really great research and we're hopeful to get more out of it. Yeah, hopefully that works here. <laughs> so you'll see signs uh, kind of, um, there's a sign in the Rose Garden that will go back out to inform the public of this research so they can learn more. Um, about the school project. Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden is another unique site that kind of falls into horticulture. They really focus on the IPM uh, process. They utilize a variety of prevention and control techniques to maintain their plant collections. Um, they use prescribed burning, hand pulling and cutting, and then chemical application when other techniques alone have been exhausted. They have youth employees that work there along with volunteers and then staff. They are primarily using um, herbicide on noxious weeds, Oriental Bittersweet, which has been renamed uh, Round Leaf Bittersweet, but you'll hear those used interchangeably. So Round Leaf Bittersweet is probably the number one, followed by buckthorn and a few other noxious weeds that they need to control um, to maintain the plant collections. Natural resource management. Um, they include 1,200 acres of our natural areas and of those natural, or our natural resource team manages 400 of that 1,200 acres. They are focused um, on control of invadive, invasive plants to enhance our natural plant regeneration. And to do this work, they utilize a variety of control techniques. Similar to Eloise Butler, you're gonna see prescribed burning, mowing, hand pulling and cutting, and then when appropriate, chemical applications. That photo in the center is that round leaf bittersweet strangling a tree. So those are ones where we do a, a stump treatment. We would cut it and treat the stump. Um, you're gonna see buckthorn cutting in parks as well, along with hand pulling. Natural resources, herbicide use in 2022 um, is reflected in the graphs there. You're gonna see a big surge in 2020. Um, another organic trial happened that year as well. And you can see um, the huge spike we saw as a result. Shoreline restoration projects, pest management along our waterways is are part of capital improvement projects. Herbicide use is only considered when alternative management strategies are not possible due to scale, topography, resource avail availability, or timeline limitations. So two projects this year were Lake Nokoma Shoreline to, and then the Kenilworth Channel. Forestry does not treat trees for pests and disease. Instead, they opt to remove and replace trees that are infested with emerald ash borer or Dutch elm disease. Treatment of trees, especially mature specimens, is cost prohibitive and must be repeated every few years for the life of the tree. Private citizens and community groups are, uh, may petition to have specific trees on MPRB property treated. And then if approved, these trees are treated by a contractor who is paid by the petitioning person organization. Um, two treatments were made on trees located in parks during 2020. Um, a green ash was treated for emerald ash borer and an American elm was treated for Dutch elm disease, um, both located along the Minnehaha Creek Parkway. 
Boulevard trees, which are also managed by MPRB, also can receive this private funding treatment. Um, but we, those are all contracted and paid by the homeowners typically, um, but are not included in this report as we're focused on parklands. Aquatic invasive species management. Um, currently our policy sets 100% threshold for aquatic weeds. So no chemical applications are made to aquatic vegetation with the exception of non-native species whose control is required by state law. Mechanical harvesting and hand pulling are our primary methods um, where there's interference with recreational use of the lakes. Uh, MPRB uh, harvest plants in the mussel infested lakes after the uninfested lakes to reduce our spread um, of those invasives to new water bodies. Um, Mechanical harvesting was performed on Cedar Lake, Lake of the Isles, Bidamakaska, and Lake Harriet in 2022. And those machines that you might see out there, the mechanical harvester are operated by our equipment operators. They remove plants in the top four to six feet of water. And then that harvested plant materials removed from the water, stored at a facility. Um, the mechanical harvesters can only harvest within uh, Minnesota DNR permitted areas. Um, so they can't operate in the middle of the deeper water or along the entire shoreline. In the appendix of the report, you will find maps of where they can harvest from. Uh, shorelines, we talked about shoreline management previously, but we have shorelines kind of fall in this weird buffer area between terrestrial and submerged aquatic. So um, our AIS, um, team did do a project that fell into a shoreline, but this plant can also be find, found terrestrially. Um, Non-native Phragmites showed up in several locations, primarily along our chain of lakes, but we also found it at the Minnesota Sculpture, or Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. Non-native Phragmites can overtake a shoreline and create unsuitable habitat for desired plants and animal species. It forms huge colonies. Um, it can grow up to 15 feet tall and block whole views of lakes because they form these very dense colonies. You can see it in the picture there. There's a, um, a staff member standing in front of um, a stand, I believe, at Lake of the Isles. Yeah. So staff worked with a contractor to implement a management plan just supported by research from the University of Minnesota's Minnesota Aquatics Invasive Species Research Center um, to do some control, both chemical and mechanical, of our non-native Phragmite stands because they were in small quantities and we felt we could tackle them in a meaningful way um, to prevent the spread. Athletic fields vary in level of care um, from our premier facilities that you would find at Neiman Athletic Complex to our community fields found in our neighborhood parks. So our highest input put sites are gonna be those premier sites, Neiman Sports Complex, Boston Field, and the Parade um, Stadium Complex. These three sites are the only sites um, they received traditional um, herbicide applications, and you can see on the graph on the right, you can compare total acreage of the park to the amount of product used per acre. Um, please note that Parade uh, Park also includes the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden, including the Spoon and Cherry Pond, um, so the land area is a little skewed. Um, weed pressure typically tends to be higher at Neiman and also at Boston than Parade due to the proximity of the highway and the large seed bank that exists in the areas around that park. Um, we did some organic pilots over the past three years. Um, this three-year trial was focused on baseball field number one at Neiman Sports Complex. Um, synthetic fertilizers were replaced with an organic product, uh, manual and mechanical Methods of weed removal were used in lieu of synthetic herbicides. Turf was routinely aerated, top dressed, and overseeded to promote healthy, dense growth that would combat weeds. And while staff concluded that the management using only OMRI certified, which is Organic Material Review Institute, um, it's an organics um, certification title um, or process. Primarily used by agricultural mm -hmm. yes. products, yes. so it's not really the most awesome list for our use. Sorry, just had to. A good it's note. An important fact. <laughs> so, when directed to use just those products, it was a challenge given our current resources. 
But the work to improve soil biology and the turf, turf health was a nice win, and the staff does want to continue that moving forward. Um, as you brought up the warning tracks, part of the um, findings of this was we need to grow in the warning tracks to be able to reduce our pesticide use. Um, and I believe at this field they did start growing in those warning tracks. Golf courses, um, we have six golf courses that are managed by um, MPRB staff. Um, this graph shows you the pesticide use per acre at each of our golf courses. They all have varying uh, sizes and weed pressure. They also did use organic products here. So you're gonna see that Hiawatha Golf in Fort Snelling implemented some organic fungicides for the 2022 season. You'll see those in blue. And then on the right, you're gonna see Meadowbrook introduce some organic plant growth regulators. So really nice to see some organic trials at three different of our um, golf courses this year. And then kind of our biggest pilot was an organic pilot at uh, Fort Snelling Golf led by um, Dan Ament. Uh, this began in 2020 and it was a three year trial. So Dan gave us some great feedback um, but it was a really challenging pilot to do at this three-year interval. In 2020, we were heavily impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So minimal inputs were being able to apply by staff as we pivoted with changing public health directive and surges in demand when the course reopened to the public. And then in 2021, uh, winter preparations were great. We set up really strong for the next growing year. Organic inputs began to be applied starting last week of April through September, and additional products were added based on thresholds and observed pressure. But then in 2022, uh, construction at the upper post flats began, and areas around the golf course um, were also under construction. Partnered with significant equipment breakdown, applications were not applied as planned. The plan was for organic inputs to be applied beginning of May through September while soil temperatures were above 45 degrees. They were scheduled on a 14 day application interview. All applications were made until the third week of June and then we had to pause until September with unanticipated impacts to the maintenance operations. That photo is gonna show you the difference between a non-organic treatment on the left and an organic treatment on the right for snow mold and you can kind of see the difference um, in it's course like appearance. Crap. Every growing season is different. We also know that 2021 and 2022 we saw a significant drought that also impacted this trial. Uh, so while these weren't typical years we know that non atypical is typical. Um, we also found that OMRI only approach isn't feasible for our current operation due to some challenges. That includes infrastructure conditions, staffing resources, user expectations, financial inputs, and then product sourcing. A lot of these products aren't easily found on the market or not in the quantities to do a small test. Um, so we had to get pretty creative on sourcing some of these. And then Dan at Fort Snelling Golf made a really great comparison chart of costs of OMRI certified products per acre or per ounce compared to our conventional products. So you can kind of see the financial impacts that we're looking at when we, when we do try to hit that OMRI only approach. <coughs> and just remember that IPM isn't a linear process. Our annual report is just a snapshot of how we implemented action plans guided by our current policy within one calendar year. As we improve our record keeping processes through technology and we invest staff time in analyzing the data we collect, we are able to recognize trends, share more work, and in turn, hopefully improve practices. Um, improvements are focused on environmental stewardship, park user satisfaction, and efficiency with resources. And we should anticipate that the upcoming season will build upon the work of 2022, but we might not show you know, that linear increase year over year. We're gonna react to the conditions that 2023 will bring us. So that is all I have for you if you guys have any questions. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer. Yeah, just a quick question to your last slide. Um, whatever happened with the jump, are they in the, in the report? I'm sorry, I didn't skim it. I'll read through it completely. But do you have a section on jumping worms and whatever happened to the mulch piles? 
jumping worms still exist. They are not in the report as they are not, um, we have no management yeah, plan yeah. for them specifically. We are still waiting for research to come out. They are not specifically in the report, but they are on our radar. Okay. Well, one thing we talked about when they were found is just how easily they are transported through piles of mulch and then people come and take our free mulch and then it's mm -hmm. spread throughout the city. So I, I don't know if Jeremy has an update on that. Uh, Jeremy, this is Commissioner Schaefer. Um, so one of the challenges is they're not considered invasive by the DNR. So there is no regulation. So one of the challenges, they can move through our wood chip piles, but you can also buy them at the bait shop. Um, so this year we will be doing some signage at the wood chip piles, letting folks know that the, the wood chips are not treated in any way. Um, so yeah. there is the possibility that they will be there. Yeah. Uh, we did go out and inspect last year the wood chip piles. We will monitor wood chip piles and we'll do signage for this year going forward. In talking to Dr. Lee Freilig, um, who I think originally found jumping worms and is like the foremost expert, mm -hmm. he considers that like where we what we should be focusing on right now is the sensitive areas along the river and monitoring there to see if the jumping worms are present there as opposed to trying to prevent the spread yep. through wood chips because they're pretty much everywhere throughout yep. throughout the metro area. Yep. Thank you for that update. Uh, Commissioner Benny. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Musich or Chair Musich. Um, I, I thought I read the report and um, and I was also, I, th I thought it was really interesting that there are issues with like min, you know, min dot right of way, you know, just because of, of you know, mainly noxious weeds, I think, primarily. And I was thinking about that. Are there other um, adjacent areas that are a problem? I don't know, railroad areas or, and then my other question is, um, does the city of Minneapolis ever inspect properties for excessive amounts of no noxious weeds or? Maybe not state land, but other lands? Chair Musich, Commissioner Benny. Um, I mean, legally, anyone can report noxious weeds. Okay. There's online tools. There's Arrest the Pest through the university extension um, where people can report those. Um, anyone can report noxious weeds that they see. And then based on what they are, um, there are government officials that can inspect or confirm whether or not, like you can report a jumping worm online and they can confirm whether or not it's a jumping worm if you have a good enough photo even. Okay. Um, yeah, it is very challenging to work next to unmanaged areas. Um, even our reduced mow areas, we might have a reduced mow hillside that's mowed once a year. Well, it will go to seed and if we have, you know, an area we want to be a little less we want to reduce weed pressure in, um, those weed seeds are going to transfer. A great example is we have the Longfellow Prairie next to Longfellow Gardens. We have a very formally maintained garden next to a, a managed natural area. We, we see a ton of weed seeds blow in from that managed natural area um, if we aren't really, really on the control of thistle and other you know, noxious weeds. And even if they're not considered noxious, there are ones that we would want to prevent in our formal landscape. So anytime we abut features like that, um, there's going to be a challenge. Okay. That's very interesting. Thank you. Wow, I'd expected a lot more questions. And Commissioner Menz, thank you for delivering an additional question. I do have a ton of questions, but it is very early in the agenda still. In my opinion, it seems like so we're going to go on, but I will th thank you so much for the presentation. It was really fascinating, especially about the ball field use of pesticides. Well, I'm sure if folks have additional questions, they're not getting answered tonight, but they feel are important for them to have answered. Uh, Kate would be happy to uh, field those via a phone call or email. Um, not seeing any additional questions, I declare the Operations and Environment Committee adjourned. Thanks everyone for your questions and time this evening and these great presentations on such an important topic. With that, at 9.04 p.m., I will call to order the Administration and Finance Committee. Can the Secretary please call the roll? Vice President Smith. <coughs> Here. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Menz. Here. Co-Chair Schaefer. Here. Co-Chair Thompson. Here. You have a quorum. Fantastic. Um, would someone like to uh, move the agenda? I would move the agenda. 
Um, all in favor of the agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that passes. Fantastic. Um, is, would someone like to move the minutes? I will move the minutes for the Admin and Finance Committee from April 12th, 2023. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? No. Okay, that passes. Um, would someone like to move our first resolution? I'll move resolution 2023-71, resolution awarding a construction contract to Custom Builders Incorporated in the amount of $1.299 million for phase one improvements at Painter Park, part of the Southwest Service Area, Mass, uh, Minneapolis, per bid event 2485, pending approval by the City of Minneapolis Finance and Property Services Procurement. Division and Minneapolis Civil Rights Department and authorizing the administrative use of a 4% construction contingency up to $53,079.48. For necessary construction change orders, it may arise with a contract for amending the 2023 Capital Improvement Program to allocate $343,842 from the Lindale neighborhood portion of the Dibble Hornstein Parkland Dedication Fund to the Phase 1 Improvements Project. Um, any discussion about this? Would you like a presentation? Is there any commentary? Doesn't look like it. So, all those in favor of resolution 2023-71, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That motion carries. Getting it. I'm getting it. <laughs> I'm getting the language. Um, I'll move resolution 2023-75. It's a resolution awarding a construction contract to Messinger Construction <laughs> Company, Inc. in the amount of $215,200 for pickleball courts at Loring Park, a part of the downtown service area per <coughs> bid ev event number 2464, pending approval by City of Minneapolis Finance and Property Services procurement division and Minneapolis Civil Rights Department and authorizing the administrative use of a 10% construction contingency up to $21,520 for necessary construction change orders that may arise with the contract and amending the 2023 capital improvement program to allocate $16,410 from the Loring Park neighborhood portion of the Dibble Hornstein Parkland Dedication Fund to complete the proposed project. These are really long day guys. They really are. <laughs> Wait till the amended one comes. Um, <laughs> is there any any questions, comments on this one? Yay. Pickleball. We're looking good. Any, we're good? Okay. All those in favor of resolution 2023-75, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? No. That motion carries. I don't have to ask. You don't have to ask for abstentions. To well, Actually, we got in trouble before, so. People that want to abstain <laughs> should note in advance that they will be abstaining from voting on the item to avoid us having to come back and do that. That sounds fantastic. I'll move resolution 2023-79, resolution awarding a construction contract to Sunram Construction, Inc. in the amount of $297,350 for sport courts and site improvements at Dickman Park located east of the river, bid event number 2290 pending approval by the City of Minneapolis Purchasing and Pro Procurement Division and Minneapolis Civil Rights Department, authorizing administrative use of a 5% construction, construction contingency up to $14,867.50 for the necessary construction change orders that may arise within the contract, and further recommending the Board of Commissioners amend the 2023 Capital Improvement Program to allocate $250,000 from the near north neighborhood portion of the Dibble Hornstein Parkland Dedication Fund to complete the com proposed project. Thank you. I, I would like to move the staff amendment yep. just to be clear that east of the river is to be excised for in the St. Anth Anthony West neighborhood and near north neighborhood is to be excised to be replaced with the St. Anthony West neighborhood. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Fantastic. Any comment Comment on the amended resolution? Seeing no lights, let's, any, all those in favor of resolution 2023-79, please say aye. 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 Sorry. Oh, I apologize, Commissioner Co-Chair. No, you're okay. No, I'm okay. All right. That, as amended. as amended, that motion carries. Thank you. 
And with that, in near record time, <laughs> I would like to close the Administration and Finance Committee for the evening. I will reconvene well then Very the full expedient. board. And I know uh, as Michael is walking up to it, I, I think I would like to have us read those um, resolutions all over again from admin and finance so we can get that over with. Cool. Sorry. We no. have an item, I believe, on the floor already. We do. Where right. And so I just am asking that we would like to, I would like to have Both these two resolutions. Because one was a, it was a study item that was on. Um, we actually, I think, are in the midst of debating resolution 2023-83, a resolution affirming resolution 2021-312, blah, 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 updating the, um, or did we pass that? Oh, okay. No, we're, we're in the middle of the All right, sorry. I thought we were in the midst of that stuff. Okay, so will you move then the um, <coughs> two things coming forward from admin and finance, please? Uh, yes, I forgot which two were coming forward. It's the um, first one and the last The first one. and the last, yes, I knew the last. Thank you. Um, I will move on behalf of admin finance resolution 2023-71. As a quick reminder, the resolution awarding a construction contract to Custom Builders, Inc. in the amount of $1,299,000 for Phase 1 improvements at Painter Park, part of the South Missouri area of Minneapolis, per bid number 2485. I think that we just heard it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the uh, resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That action carries on to the next resolution. I will also move on behalf of Admin Finance Resolution 2023-79, and I believe we just heard it as amended uh, two minutes ago, so we'll leave <laughs> okay. there. All those in favor? Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Action carries. Okay. So we have two staff people who can uh, leave and... Take it over, Assistant Superintendent. All right, thank you, uh, Forney. So we just finished with the rehab and the, the components of the, 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 com the companion to that is the capital. So I'll walk through that quickly, right, kind right of in the same manner that I did in the rehab. Um, so this is important because this relates to Chapter 17 and the process we use for establishing parks to, for uh, their participation in the NPP 20 is through Chapter 17's equity rankings. So through that, every year we, um, will evaluate, score, and rank the neighborhood parks and has come up with a new ranking um, using that system from Chapter 17. This is the list of projects from 2021. If you recall, we did a bunch of deferring of capital projects during COVID so we could do better engagement. And so we're now catching up with many of these. So if you look at some of them, like the 28th Street Tot Lot, um, this it says delivery in the summer of 2024. Even though this is a 2021 project, we're still moving ahead on that. There's several here that are like that, but um, we are actually moving forward on just about every one of those. Um, there's a few that are left down in, that are actually starting the design, Powderhorn, Sibley, and Whittier. We're in the design phase for that. And you awarded a, a contract on Painter Park tonight. Um, this is the 2022. Um, what happens with our program is when we get pro uh, projects into the capital program, it usually takes us three years to get them implemented. So year one is around community uh, engagement and design. The second year typically is design and bidding, and then we finish the project in the third year. So we have fewer projects completed in 2022. Um, and then when we get to um, 2023, you'll see that um, we have very few projects actually started. And remember, that this was as of, as of the end of last year. So even if we look at this, this list, there are several on there that were actually uh, actually in the process of designing or scoping, um, and some, uh, I believe, we're actually moving forward with implementation. Um, the, there were also a series of projects that we're catching up on that were funded prior to 2021, um, and so you'll see that these two are scoping and, and even some uh, th that have uh, advanced forward with some of the dollars that have been awarded even in the last couple of meetings. Um, so we're at, so instead of some of these where it says we're, uh, uh, where it looks like we have not expended dollars yet, like Jordan Park was actually, uh, I think uh, um, we are actually moving through com uh, work on that one now. Um, and I, I know that Julie had to leave uh, for a family uh, issue, but I'll just sum up 
uh, with this, and uh, Commissioner or Superintendent Bangora and I have talked about this. Um, through NPP 20, we've expended more than $60 million in improving our neighborhood park since it was put in place. And Superintendent Bangor has noted many times as he's driving around the system, there seems to be activity going on everywhere. And it's really now in this, in these years, these last couple of years, we've really begun to see the, the significant improvements throughout the system. Um, so it's been a great program for us. We'll be doing the similar um, report, I think, to the Ways and Means Committee at City Hall. And I think in the past, BET has also asked for a presentation. So this is just a warm up for, our, for Julie and I to go on the road a little bit. <laughs> Okay, questions, thank you. Um, Commissioner, yeah, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Forney. Uh, thank you for this report, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder and all of your staff that contributed to it. Um, I was on the board when we adopted this measure and to see it actually being built out, to see it impacting the spaces that we all live and play in it has just been really phenomenal to see. Um, people are especially excited about air conditioning in rec centers, particularly rec centers that host our senior programming and our um, rec plus programs. Those buildings have been crazy hot these past couple of years and, and to have AC has been huge. So um, I, I am thankful for my colleagues still support us continuing this work. Um, I hope, I'm hopeful that the people of Minneapolis will support extending this program. Um, and perhaps expanding it to meet our actual needs now that we have a better feel for, for what it actually costs to maintain the system we've got. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Council Rice. If I could make a quick comment, uh, the Senate Tax Committee met today and they're including a 1% sales tax for um, St. Paul and a quarter uh, billion of that sales tax will go to their park and rec system and there's also about 30 other t sales taxes around the state that are being added um, and I'd say at least 25 percent of them are going to park projects because of the need for other communities to do it so I guess what I'd say is once again the system was probably uh, almost a decade ahead of other park systems and recognizing the need that you've you're going to run a have a world-class park system you gotta pay for it and I think the legislature's seeing that now and in, in like I say st. Paul's quarter billion dollar sales tax for their park system will be about what this NPP 20 thing is doing thank you for that update uh, Commissioner Schaefer I was curious if you had a sense of you know, we've had COVID, so we've had some delays. What, what does the bucket look like for projects that are still prior to 2021 that still haven't been funded or, you know, 20, can you kind of give a snapshot on, you know, because I know planning has been stretched. People have been stretched in a lot of different directions, not just planning and trying to get a sense of you know, this looks great on paper, but you got a steam train coming behind you. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, is this, this half of this, is that half of the train or, you know what I mean? Sure. Maybe you don't know what I mean, but that I, I'm trying to explain it. Um, uh, President Forney and Commissioner Schaefer, I think I do know what you mean. And we've actually talked about this quite a bit um, amongst the planning staff. Um, we are anticipating, there'll, there'll be a, a good discussion on this because we have this thing called undeveloped parks that you'll hear about next week at the budget retreat. Um, but even anticipating bringing those into the system as we should, we anticipate that we'll cover every neighborhood park by uh, the, the um, 18th year of the program. So 2034 uh, or 2035, um, depending upon how things go. So we'll, we'll end with a little bit of time cushion um, and there may actually be some parks that we start to revisit for a second time during the 20 year period. If that answers your question, I think I, th I think we, we're looking that we'll be finishing in 2034 or 2035 with the current with the current parks that are in the program. And how many are still waiting that are prior to 21? Is it kind of um, Adam Adam might know exactly where we are in the system because he he tracks us and he'll tell you where we are within the metric of 160 some neighborhood parks. <laughs> Sure. Um, uh, President Forney, Commissioner uh, Schaefer, 
Um, so all the parks that are currently ranked through um, uh, just short of number 60 have, have, are in our CIP. So that's stretching out to 2028, when you look out to 2028, up through 60, <laughs> plus a few others that are scattered that have lower rankings because they've dropped mm -hmm. since they brought into the CIP. So we probably got about 70 parks that we've invested in in the first half of NPP 20 out of 151. Some of those parks are the undeveloped parks, which will get lower allocations often. So that's why we predict that 2034 is the likely year where we'll be finishing the first round of parks and starting to make second investments in the highest equity ranked parks at that time. And then 35 and 36 are the final two years of NPP 20. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I, I too just, as Commissioner Music says, I worked on this and it's huge. Um, I think uh, Council Rice said it very well. Um, we were ahead of the time and yet in so many ways we were way behind in the sense of um, attending to just this basic um, fundamental part of our park system. And that's why it really excites me. Uh, remind everybody that we've got a couple of huge initiatives that is of, of the same caliber as this and the impact is gonna be amazing. So um, hope everybody's ready for that race as well. Um, thank you for the presentation. And so we will move on then to our, oh, I forgot to mention that our racial equity study item will be presented um, on the 10th of May, um, hopefully Carrie will be well by then. Um, and so we'll have the skate park activity plan update and uh, our senior planner, uh, Colleen O'Dell, take it away. Hello again, commissioners. So the skate park activity plan update, this is not an update of the plan that we have already passed. This is an update from me to you about what's in the plan um, and what we've accomplished so far related to the plan um, at the request of Commissioner Menz. The timing is important because there's the potential for some state money coming down the pike that we might want to apply for. <clears throat> So this plan was adopted in 2018, so it's about five years old. It had four years of engagement and research that led into it, which is a little more than we usually do, but this was before we were um, really going with our uh, service area master plan, so we were still learning. And an important point is that the people who formed our steering committee for this plan, after it was passed, formed City of Skate on their own as a nonprofit. So we were really working with a lot of skaters themselves, experts in the field. <clears throat> The contents of this plan are primarily background information, data, history, trends. Um, and then the second half is all guidelines that were uh, crafted by the experts that we were working with on the steering committee. So guidelines around how many parks should we have, what kind, where should they be? Um, how will we choose who the contractors and construction worker, uh, organizations will be for the best possible outcome? How do you build sustainability into these skate parks? And uh, what are the best operations and maintenance uh, activities to uh, focus on? And then the plan itself had three main goals with implementation strategies. So the goal one was to increase the number, variety, and distribution of public skate parks in Minneapolis. <clears throat> in 2018, when we passed this, we had six parks uh, in the city. And the goal was to increase that to 18. So we had about 30,000 square feet of skate parks. The goal was to increase that to 181,000 based on um, some data that is in that plan that you can review. Goal two, address policy barriers to high quality skate park experiences. An example of this that we've been working on is um, our regional parks have not uh, traditionally allowed us to spend funds on um, skate parks in our regional parks. And so we're working with Met Council to try to address that and uh, see that those could be acceptable uses. 
Goal three, improve the overall skate park experience through design operations, inclusion, partnership, and safety measures. So we have worked with two key partners on this, which you are probably familiar with, City of Skate, which as I mentioned, helped with the steering committee for this plan. Um, and the Midwest Skateboarding Alliance, which you may not have heard of, that's a woman-led organization that's working with us primarily on uh, the break room possible skate park downtown. Now, these have often been um, informal collaboration partnerships that we've been doing, but we have in the past had an overarching MOU with City of Skate. And since that has expired, we've been focusing on project-specific agreements with them to help support the design and development of these skate parks. It's possible we'll do an overarching one again, but at this point, that's not where we're at. Here's a map that's showing you that in the five years since we passed the plan, we currently have eight complete or in-progress projects citywide right now, and those are the ones that are in color. And then we have about 12 that are ahead that are planned that we'd like to have implemented that are in our master plans. And this includes a variety of sizes, styles, um, including some potentially much larger community-sized uh, projects of around 30,000 square feet. And we're looking at maybe Northeast Athletic Field, Nokomis, Bidema Koska for those. So the reason for understanding all of this now about the plan is that the state is gearing up to potentially make some funds available through their Minnesota State Skate Park Grant Program. And it's a dollar for dollar matching program <clears throat> administered through the Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission, very similar to the way they do Hennepin County Youth Sports Grants, with about half of them earmarked for metro area. So it's still under development, so there's some pieces that we're not quite sure of yet until the end of the legislative session on May 22nd-ish. Um, the goal is $18 million for funding. We'll see if we get that much, <clears throat> if, the pro if the program gets that much, with individual projects getting between $500,000 to $2 million um, in grants. And there are a number of projects that we're hoping, we're keeping our eye on it as staff, hoping we can apply for. Um, amongst those that seem lined up and ready to go would be Northeast Athletic Field, Falwell, Botano, and possibly some others. So I just wanted to give you that brief outline. I hope that that was an exciting way to start to wrap up the end of tonight. Do you have any questions? Questions, Commissioner Musit. Thank you, President Forney. Uh, Colleen, I appreciate your dedication to continuing to further skateboarding in Minneapolis. Uh, when I joined the board, we really only had some outdated skate parks designed for like something you would put in your backyard. And we put them in parks. And um, they're falling apart. And to see now that we're actually building skate facilities that skaters are proud to be at and using is fabulous. So thank you for all your hard work. I really hope we can get some money from the state so we can uh, continue to accelerate the implementation of the modern skate experience here in the system. Thanks. Commissioner Musich. Excuse me, Commissioner Mance. It's That's late, okay. you guys. It's getting late. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for bringing this to the board. Uh, thank you, uh, President Forney. So I asked, I asked Colleen and I asked the planners to bring this because it is timely. Um, there is money coming, and I think that us being grounded in what uh, has been planned is really important. It also, for the, for the new facility studies, I mean, I see this plan as some sort of model, not only model of like what the product might be, but also the model of the engagement that was done around this plan to sort of create like a cross system um, plan around skate parks, sort of like with diamonds or fields. So it's so th this is sort of where my thinking was when we created those facility study plans, which May 1st, there's a meeting. Um, Colleen is also, ex so, and I want the board to really understand, and you can see this in, in, in the skate park activity plan, that there are different designations of what skate parks are. So not everything is a skate park. Some of them are skate spots. I can't remember what the middle, maybe skate. There's different sizes, and those are indicated by different levels of you know, what skaters really want. Or for us as a park board, what we can really like be like super awesomely proud of. And 
I've been working with City of Skate um, to really, I, I think that we need to build the regional size facility. The one thing that hasn't been implemented in this plan because of funding and because we want to get skate parks into local community parks and they're cheaper is let's get people skating. But now it might be time for that, that regional facility, which is in the plan either zoned for Nokomis or Northeast Field Park right next to, um, so <laughs> Commissioner Musich and I will we'll duke it out. Um, but I think that there is a there, there is an open space right next to Lupian Water Park, and the community is is ready um, to to do something like that. So I I really appreciate the staff responding, um, and I hope and I don't know what Pamela and what Brian have heard at the legislature. I know that there was a skate skate park um, uh, advocacy day, and that people Paul Forsling you sent you you got an email from Paul Forsling today. So I just want us to be prepared if that money comes through, how do we prioritize that and how do we implement parts of this plan that might be available now? Yeah. Um, commissioners and um, Commissioner Menz and I don't know who the chair is, of <laughs> President Forney. <laughs> um, they did hear Senator Dibble's bill um, when they were hearing um, the individual bills to put together a cash bonding bill. And it was on the same day that our Cedar Riverside bill was heard, so we were able to hear the testimony on that. Um, and they did, the language does specifically name park and recreation boards as grant recipients, which is great. Um, so yeah, we'll see what, what that bill looks like in the last hour of the session, probably. Yeah, I think there was like, I thought- uh, Microphone. Microphone. Um, President Forney Commissioner, um, I believe the house, the bill that passed the house floor had four million for skate parks in mm -hmm. it. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something more? Can I, yeah, I, I turned my light off and I apologize. I think I have 45 seconds left. Um, thank you. So yeah, I mean the four million is probably more likely. The 18 million is like a dream in the pie. Uh, the last thing is I just want to really, like I appreciate Colleen explaining the city of skate has been a partner in this and sometimes it's been a willing and sometimes an unwilling and like but that skaters being involved in these processes is so important and also the design build concept of what's designed is also built by the same people or the same group and i think that that's a really important concept that we might have to decide upon as a policy board around how these facilities are built so i just kind of wanted to Put that out there to the, the staff, to the board around, if this money comes through, what are some things that are gonna be coming up in front of us? Commissioner Alper. Thank you, I will be quick. Uh, thanks for that update, really appreciated it. Uh, appreciate it. I, um, you, you can probably guess what I'm gonna bring up, uh, Central Gym Skate Park. In the interest of time, let's not talk about it tonight, but could, could we follow up? Could you give me an update tomorrow Perhaps written. I'm looking. I'm looking at Cliff and the audience. So, if it tomorrow or or the next day, um, I would greatly appreciate it because I don't want to lose you lose the Hennepin County Youth Sports Grant um, as we think about new money coming in. And then uh, what was my other thing? Oh, that I just really feel that we need project level agreements with our partners on um, you know thinking about like. With Central Gym, I would really like to see a project level agreement with City of Skate outlining expectations, having clear communication, and I, I could imagine that being beneficial for other um, skate park uh, projects as well. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, uh, so I have a couple questions. Um, first of all, uh, you said something about a dollar to dollar uh, match. Is that a dollar from us? matching the state? Yes, that's correct, as I understand it. Okay, um, then speaking to that, uh, would that include, I know that City of Skate has indicated, or I believe that's what our <laughs> agreement is that they're bringing in funding, would that include their funding as well? That I'm not as clear on, but we're negotiating and talking about that. Okay, no, I think that's very essential for us to, uh, to be aware of, you know, what is our part and what our other partners are. Commissioner Alper. May I, I just would like to follow up about that because I don't believe that we have a overarching 
agreement in place with city of skate right now and that's why i'm really advocating for these project level um agreements i, I don't know if we're going to come to a consensus on uh, overarching agreement and therefore like having that expectation <coughs> set in writing about who's bringing what to the table i feel is really important because right now it feels unclear i wholeheartedly agree oh excuse me commissioner um shit Sure. Well, I think um, if the MOU is not valid anymore, if they just said they were moving towards a project based, and we know we have that at 28th Street Tot Lot, where City of Skate has really brought forward the design um, to the park board. I don't know about the funding piece, but I, I, it seems like that's the direction we're already trending. Um, I'm not certain, Colleen, but at least. Okay. Oh. <laughs> President, President Forney, if I could just really quick, Commissioner Schaefer, Please. you're right. At 28th Street, Kale Hailstone, our project manager, is working with um, CDS Gate really on a design build MOU. We're kind of working through some details of uh, liability and how that would get done. That's the tricky part for us. When we have outside people that are going to uh, build something, we just have to make sure we have the right liability in place. So th there'll be some agreements coming forward here before the board here uh, shortly. 428th Street, tall lot. Excellent, thank you. Not seeing any other lights then. Uh, I will go to petitions and communications and start with uh, Commissioner Renz. Um, I'm gonna pass today, except for the fact that I forgot to report on the MTAC committee, which was actually fun because we got to go to the tree lot and um, learn all about all the trees that we're going to plant this year and just it was it was a really slushy day but uh it was interesting to learn about the trees with all the foresters mr schaefer i just want to um say thank you to commission uh assistant superintendent schroeder for the letter that was attached to our petitions and communications around the plant to the around the zoning and in particular, the mention of the short land ordinance in that. That's it. Commissioner Upper. Pass. Hey, uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Forney. I would just like to remind my colleagues that we have a super fun event coming up on Friday uh, in Commissioner yeah, Menz's district. Uh, so I hope to see you all Friday night to plant a tree together um, that we can go hug in our dotage. Um, to remind us of these wonderful times serving together on the park board someday. Um, also, there's a lot of invasive species removal events coming up all over the city. So uh, if you're looking for something to show up and help out with, reach out to our volunteer coordinator, Sherry Brooks, and she will help connect you to some of those events. Thanks. Commissioner Thompson. Thank you. I, I normally would pass in this moment, but I, I'm not going to now, and I actually have something written that has been on my heart all day, um, and it has to do with what happened last night, and I will take a moment for myself and for all women who have been in my position. Um, last night at North Commons, there was a meeting for this project, um, and it became very heated. And at one point, Mr. Mike Tate uh, I was I was attempting to intercede on a question uh, that I had the answer for and he shouted at me uh, sit down and shut up and the entire room witnessed this including President Meg Forney my colleague Commissioner Billy Menz the executive director of the Parks Foundation Tom Evers several of our staffers and even two reporters everyone saw that moment far fewer saw what happened to me in the back of the room approximately three minutes later as Mr. Tate walked past me he he lunged toward me with his fist raised and said I'm done with you and I'm still quite startled to replay it in my mind as indeed I have replayed it many times in the last 24 hours for I at one point considered Mike Tate my friend he took a quick step toward me raised his fist to my face and said I'm done with you I don't think I need to remind you that I'm a woman and he is a man. In fact, he spent most of the night sitting right there. I have tired of a world 
where men feel comfortable threatening women. I am tired of the narrative of other men telling those same women to let it go. I'm tired of people undermining one another to create a space for animus. Far too often, well-meaning human beings excuse violence or shrink their ears when tales don't fit the narrative that they wish to hear. I do not condone violence of any kind, including what has pervaded many parts of the community that I live in and I see every day. No, I cannot just let it go. No, I will not just dismiss it as passion to be excused and damaging still abusive behavior. It is even more so important for me to convey from this dais in this moment, as I proudly sit here with six other elected women attempting to eradicate this original status quo of the old boy network. Given that truth, I feel that I must speak out about last night. So no, I cannot let it go. I do not see aggressive threats to my person as passion that can be expected around a project. I will Never, when a man threatens a woman in any capacity or in any setting, he is evo evoking an age-old supposed right to power. He has a right to shout her down. He has a right to have his voice heard over hers. He has a right to place her in a corner. When a man threatens a woman, he threatens the entirety of womanhood. And I will not excise my womanhood from myself, never, no. Others might try to make this argument about a park or about passion, but these are old gaslight techniques meant to tell women that the abuse and threats to their person are meant to be shouldered in silence. Speaking up is not acceptable. It makes people uncomfortable. To see a mirror held before them, well, let me be your mirror ball. When women speak up to call tacit abuse and gaslighting to the carpet, we support all women who've had their voices diminished. I would like to add for the record for people who do not know this from the video of our meeting that Mr. Tate the man who threatened me just last night was sitting directly opposite me for the first three hours of this meeting. When I took a break to attempt to call my son, I heard Mr. Tate's voice in the hall and did not feel comfortable to step out. This is what happens to women. I started crying in the corner like a little girl. Yeah, that just happened an hour and a half ago during the time of this meeting. I refuse to see that as weakness. I state this as to shine a light on the trauma women carry in their bodies, both from the abuse of men and the gaslighting of other men, that they are simply meant to shoulder it in silence. I will not be silent on this or on any other issue. I make this a big deal right now for my constituents, my colleagues, and most of all, my students. Women and girls need women who sit in a position to have their voice amplified to use it, and so I will, and so I do. Yesterday, Mike Tate physically moved to strike me. Today, he sat 20 feet from me for three hours as though it was no big deal. I spent the day feeling sick while trying to do my other job, which is teaching. I spent the day in deep anxiety for what might transpire in this meeting. That is what it is to be a woman. And I don't doubt that every single woman in this room who populated even before they went home has felt this way at least once. And sadly, I don't doubt that every single one of my students has also. I will not tolerate this in any form, not for me, not for anyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Commissioner Benny. Yeah, I, I, and um, yeah, I, th I think the stakes, the stakes don't need to be, um, we can't forget that we're, you know, we all live in our, the city, we're all, we're all residents, and so we, we, should, we should really rethink, I think, sometimes our stake, the stakes we're bringing to the, some of these discussions. So thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Um, I want to, I wanted to say I went to um, our, um, Earth Day uh, in D District 6, I was able to hit four locations. Uh, it was interesting to see great turnout, and especially because it was pretty much snowing. And, um, 
And actually, uh, uh, real, real props to Bryant Square Park and the South Lindale, uh, South Uptown neighborhood. They had this really uh, good method of kind of gridding out the neighborhood on a, on a big uh, map and with a grease marker, and then they would assign people. So people were distributed all throughout that neighborhood very broadly, including Commissioner Olson. That's right. He was picking up the neighborhood. And then the other thing I want to say, um, um, I, bra I bravely uh, posted uh, the link to the great uh, communication uh, release about the band shell <laughs> and the band shell color on next door. That's right. I'm willing to go there. And um, <laughs> I'm telling you, 100% positive. 100%. When does that ever happen? So thank you so much, <laughs> Cliff Swenson and team. So um, that's it for me. Vice President Smith. Um, well, it's the end of April, but, uh, hey, Thompson, I'm sorry you had that experience with, uh, with Mike and probably felt isolated. That is really disappointing to hear. I was not there, um, so I am sorry to hear that. Nobody wants to be made to feel uncomfortable or fearful or triggered by it, um, here at this meeting. Um, tonight even again so uh, I stand with you in solidarity um, as a woman and in that space like that yeah so um, I just like to give a huge shout out to the staff as, as usual I, I appreciate the work that you guys do I appreciate the staff in the room at 946 um, to the staff that I've been able to connect with we have a new director um, at our park in Corcoran who I know um, from community in North Minneapolis, Joy, um, and I'm excited to see Joy bopping through the neighborhood and looking to bring a new level of, of vibrancy to Corcoran outside of the summer months because sometimes it gets really quiet uh, in the neighborhood during the winter and fall. So super excited about that. And yeah, that's about it for me. Thank you. Um, as we all know, uh, at our last meeting, we passed a couple of resolutions, and um, I've been doing the quote-unquote dog and pony show um, several times. Uh, one of them I did with uh, Commissioner Abene, and I just want you to know, uh, please, any opportunity that you have to speak, you know, to your community, to your constituents, um, get on their agendas um, for neighborhood meetings and everything. Um, and, and like I say, you know, staff has provided some really good um, PowerPoints, you know, for us to be able to utilize. But um, we need to be speaking to the community about these needs. Um, they are very, very significant. Um, as um, Superintendent Bangor, they are our legacy. So um, please take advantage of, you know, what's been produced. Um, I wanted to make a huge shout out. We have such unbelievably professional staff. I was honored to go to the um, CLIC, uh, Capital Long Range Improvement uh, Committee presentation done by um, uh, Director, um, Strategic Director um, Arvidsson. Um, really, we have a great deal to be proud of. Uh, these guys uh, know their stuff, um, and, and I, I just was so proud of how what you produced, um, and um, hopefully we'll get some money. Um, anyway. Um, and then another one that i not sure I'm going to say names right and everything, but it's our Manage Natural Areas link that Andrew Maratetz, I'm not sure I'm saying his name, and James Schaefer uh, produce. It's just awesome. Um, I've sent it out to several people, and they just oh, they're floored, you know, by it. So thank you, thank you, um, staff, for producing that. Um, all sorts of other fun things. Eloise is open. I was there the first uh, group to go through. Um, see now, Earth Day. Yes, it was cold, but amazed at how many people show up for it. Um, very exciting things. Um, yes, Arbor Day. How can you possibly not mention that one? The most important part of it, though, is the arborators. The arborators up in the trees. Great entertainment. So please uh, make sure everybody Friday to go to that. And then just a big, huge reminder um, that um, next um, uh, Wednesday is our first of our budget retreats. It will be taking place here. Then the following uh, two weeks later on the 17th, it will. I noticed everybody was kind of running around getting uh, whatever bags of snacks from <laughs> the concessions. 
I'm hoping that we'll have some food for our um, budget retreat. <laughs> Will we? Yeah. Yes, okay, good, good, okay. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, not the best food back there, gang. Anyway, um, and then also, what is it, the fourth, um, the mayor will be having the state of the city. Um, hope some people can attend that. So um, on that, I will adjourn of the meeting here at 949. And Leisha's getting married. Woo! Oh, yeah! <laughs> Happening, lady. Oh, wow. I wish you told us. Thank you. Yeah. In Spain. In Spain?